Yes, guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Daily Dose podcast. Today, we have a very special guest yet again, someone I've been excited to speak to for a while. He's part of the infamous No Coast League, which will soon be branching out to the UK as well. But Kelly Betts, how's it going, man? What's up, man? I'm super happy to be on here. Me too, man. I'm, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. And it's uh, an episode I've been looking forward to. And then last night when we were we were kind of prepping for the episode a bit further, you let me in on some uh, some pretty interesting stories of yours, man. So you've uh, you've been in quite a successful punk band as well as being involved in battle rap. Is that right? Yeah, as successful as a punk band can be, um, you know, sure. whatever whatever that is. Um, yeah, we kind of just hit a good angle at the right time and did like an art punk thing um, when people were looking for that. Um, it was a band called Task Force. And so we just had like one piece of vinyl come out, but I've, I'll still like see it in a record store, which is pretty surreal. But yeah, toured that for a little bit. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's funny. Basically, you hit me up and you were like, oh, I can't wait to talk about your battle career. And I was like, let's not. There's so many more interesting things about me because like um, I've just lived a pretty big life outside of battles. And I, I think um, it's influenced the way I've handled battles. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I think that uh, when it comes to talking to somebody to get like an impression of me, it's like t- to act like I was focused on no coast this whole time or, or that it's, you know, whatever the, you know my main focus even is uh i think a little bit of a misrepresentation sure no absolutely and like for me i i i'm a huge battle rap fan i'm a huge hip-hop fan yeah all of my friends are the absolute opposite but oh man so what are they, what are, my, what are they uh, into just like indie rock and born stuff well two of my close friends are, are very into the punk scene over here so okay. they're big on I don't know if you're aware of many UK bands at the moment, but like they're they're big on groups like the Murder Burgers, um Aerial Salad. Okay, great names. Um I wanna say Propagandy. Okay. Yeah. Um and Propagandy kind of, played in my friend's basement. Amazing. <laughs> Cause I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, yeah uh, propaganda are the the only ones that i've ever attempted to listen to because I'll, I'll be honest a lot of it isn't my cup of tea but yeah it's, um, well to me punk rock is a in-person experience i don't spend my time um in my car or like at home playing punk rock but i, I still go to the shows i'll still like you know go and be at the punk spaces like um just to see it in person and then i you know get in the car and put on modest mouse again or something no, I like that. I, I'm very similar. I could never sit at home and listen to it. However, yeah. as a live experience, I can definitely appreciate it, and it's it's good fun. But how how long ago was it that you you kind of went on tour with the band then? Uh, let's see. Actually, at the same time that No Coast was starting, so it was, it was about ten years ago. Okay. Um, and um, in fact, it was it was kind of like um. Like when No Coast happened, I'd um, like um, gotten my life together somewhat. I'd like um, quit uh, doing drugs. I was just uh, drinking and smoking pot for the first time. So it kind of temporarily cleaned up my head and I, and I uh, got No Coast going. And then I like fell off again and got into the punk thing. And so it's kind of like No Coast success kind of threw me off a little bit. And so you can actually kind of see it. Like if you watch the early videos, there's me like talking and looking like a sane person. And then like a year later, I'm got the my mohawks crooked and like my shirts half on and I'm all disheveled and saying uh, wacky shit. And that's because I was often on touring with uh, the punk band at that time. And then, uh, yeah, for some of that just ended up uh, basically it's like I toured so much that I ended up. Like just being like, you know, it'd be easier if I just lived in the van when we weren't on tour. Um, so it kind of like threw off uh, the trajectory a good bit. But yeah, so I guess to get technical, like 2010, 2011 were those days. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, 
I mean, so I've I've recently there's there's quite a few battles on your part that I've not seen before. Um, it's best to keep it that way. That's 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 a good place for one. <laughs> but um, it's I've been kind of exploring a couple of the older battles as well that I've not seen. Um, if I'm honest, with No Coast, I, I was a bit late to the party. I um, yeah, I only discovered No Coast when Mickey, Canal, Bowski, people like that started to come over for your events. Yeah, um, I'd kind of seen the odd battle beforehand. Um, I remember seeing. Uh, B Magic versus somebody I can't remember who it is now and then there was a a T Rex battle on No Coast as well. Yeah, right? yeah. T Rex came really early on, um, and battled uh, our guy G Soldier. Um, yes, that was it. God, that was just surreal. That 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 was that was weird. <laughs> I can imagine. And uh, where was that event? Was that in St. Louis or? No, that was here where I'm stationed, which is called Columbia, Missouri, and uh, we call it Como. I, 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 I generally just call it Como, uh, Columbia, Missouri. It's a college town about two hours from St. Louis. But right, okay. um, So basically, we're in between Kansas City and St. Louis, and that's basically where all of our talent comes from. And um, the reason we were able to start was because all these rappers were going to college here. Okay, sure. That makes sense. And it's, it's um, like... The no coast events, for the most part, one of the reasons that I became a big fan of no coast and I battle falls under this category as well is I just enjoy watching events where you can tell that it's just a fun time vibe in the room as well. Oh um, yeah, you know the, I'm not the biggest URL fan in the world. It's a bit mm. too serious for me in that sense, but yeah, I'm. Over the last few years, at least, I've become a huge fan of No Coast. And how oh, was it that you. you got involved in in No Coast from the beginning then? Yeah. So there's a lot of ways I could phrase this, um, but I was a battler. I was like the only battler in Columbia, Missouri. <laughs> um, I was battling everybody. I was at uh, this uh, open mic night that you had to sign up for called Mad Real Monday. And I was doing freestyle battles there. And then I started doing written battles at a... Uh, at a alternative comedy night, and then I kind of took those two scenes and decided to draw talent from both of them and call it a league, and got my friends to film, and so I started the started the league um, by pulling it together. But kind of to pull in the what what you said the appeal of Nokos is, which I have to agree, which is like the 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 crowd is clearly just having a good time and like it's a loose environment. Um, to pull that into your answer would be that. Uh, I was throwing parties and I'd run like party house venues for uh, four or five years already at that point. Um, so kind of like having indie bands and punk bands that were touring, come and play in my basement or in my living room in this like, you know, college party town um, was a normal part of my life. And I was uh, taking uh, throwing parties more and more seriously to where like I'd set up like a illegal bar and like sell alcohol and like make some money off of it. And uh, and whatever hustle and this and that. And um, so then uh, venues started letting me do local rap shows. And so when No Coast started, I kind of talked my way into these like uh, hipster punk rock spots and uh, started throwing battles there and uh, calling it a league. Um, being technically one of the first uh, five uh, written leagues for YouTube. Uh, you know, so, yeah, just kind of like. Everything lined up the right way really uh, early on. Definitely, man. And uh, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of some of the some of the, the battles that you filmed early on, I, rem I, I recently watched a battle of yours, which is filmed in like I, it looks like a gas station. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like a battle battle. <laughs> that is like, um, yeah, the hip hop open mic. I battled this guy static. And he didn't write anything, and he thought he could just – even though we warned him, and I just clobbered him, and it was ugly. It's not even online because it's so – he's a friend of mine, and it's it's uncomfortable. And so then he was still talking shit afterwards, and I was like, well, meet me next week at the open mic. And then he doesn't show up, 
And um, so it's the next week and I, I, I've written more bars and I'm waiting for him and I'm waiting for him and I'm like drinking Mountain Dew and shit and like trying to like keep a level head because I know I might have to battle at any second. And then 1 a.m., which is when bars close here, I'm like, all right, let's call it. And I just like, boom, slam, pints, bam, 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 bam to the face. And just start getting fucked up. And then it's like 1.30 and my phone rings and he's like, you still want to do this? Meet me at the gas station. Because that gas station is not a random spot. It used to have like uh, real nice like um, souped up cars and like like just uh, show up. People kind of show off their cars there. It was like just a, a hub for hood rat shit. Okay. But this fo- this uh, college football player got mugged there and they, they, they shut it all down. But anyway, that was like. That was probably like my fifth or sixth rap battle I'd gotten in at that gas station. But since I'd written bars, I had this lady come and film it. So that was like at 3 a.m. And uh, yeah, that that was like a, a good representative of what like Como hip hop and battling was like before the league really started. Um, because people have always just battled here more than other places because it is a transient town and there are so many outsiders and there is a rap crowd that you're like competing for. So I think it's just been a natural, uh, a natural thing. Okay. No, and it was, it was a fun watch. It, you know, it's, um, it's very Thank different to, to most battles that I've ever seen in that sense anyway, but it was, uh, Old school. yeah, great fun to see. But were you, had you been a, a, a fan of battle rap as a whole for a long time before you started no coast then? And are you, I had, Were you always big into hip hop as well? Not always. I I got into punk rock really early at like eleven and twelve, just because of my sister who would like fuck my hair up and you know just like help me dress up and look cool and build this identity. And um, I always had guitars and drums and stuff. And then I I I'd hurt my my dad is like a really cool guy and he always played all sorts of music so he would play like old 80s like 70s and 80s hip hop so I'd heard kind of some of like the origins but I got on the bandwagon of like hating everything that was coming out as far as like new rap like I thought it was cool to hate that and then like the Beastie Boys um put out um uh uh Oh, what's the one where they're in the sardine cans? Um, you know, anyway, some new Beastie Boys came out, and I think like Eight Mile came out, and I just, you know, it kind of like pulled me into um, like the, the the technicality, you know, more, and like cool. the instrumentation, and then the adrenaline of battling, and um, I I just totally 180, and I remember I like showed up to band practice and had a had a chain on and baggy pants and was like we're gonna be rappers now and like bought my guitarist like a turntable set and like it was like i've got news you know because i was always kind of like the leader dude i was always kind of like the the leonardo of the of uh, you know from the ninja turtles of my group and so i was like guys we're rappers now or whatever and um yeah just it would have been like uh oh three oh four started watching every battle I could find online, which at that point was like not that many guys, you know, like, um, but yeah, just became obsessed with it basically. Um, yeah, just became obsessed with battling really early on. Nice. And it, I mean, over there, I mean, the, the, the whole hip hop scene and especially battle rap is, it's a lot more accessible in the States than it ever has been in the UK. Unfortunately, I think for the majority of people my age that are into hip hop, they would say that, well, I I believe they'd all say pretty much the same as me and that they got into it through Eminem. And that was one of the first people really that ever kind of made it mainstream over here. Um, Yeah obviously your nwas and your wu-tangs in the earlier days but like um i was i was born in like the the mid 90s so it's mm. uh, by that point it, it was eminem was the the first thing I, i'd heard but what was the the earlier stuff that you were kind of listening to when you were younger there yeah well i, I, I like i, I the, the earliest rap song i remember digging is like a seven eight year old was the don't push me because i'm close to the edge and it just yeah. had that and then like hearing run dmc 
and stuff that had that like rock and roll edge to it, stuff that sounded like angry and had like kind of like a hard downbeat. I definitely always gravitated towards that. And um, I would say like as far as being in hip hop and, and it being accessible to me in reality didn't happen until I came up here to go to college because I was on a fucking farm. You know, I was in the middle of, <clears throat> excuse me, the Ozarks. I was in the middle of the woods. I was, you know, I was really isolated um, as far as actually getting to see rap live. And so by the time I came up here, it was like I jumped full force into like all these freestyle ciphers and graffiti and, you know, break dancers and everything you affiliate it with. I kind of like jumped head first into it. But I, before then, as a kid and as a teen, I just kind of obsessed on my computer. And it was mostly me just trying to convince my like two or three punk rock friends to like emulate this stuff that I'd seen in a video, you know, that I downloaded from LimeWire. So that was how most of my life was spent for sure. Just, yeah, memorizing Eminem lyrics and trying to write as much like him as I could and, um, you know, shit like that. But, um, you know, if you would have ran into me in high school, I'd be like, oh, I'm into super underground stuff like Eminem, you know, <laughs> like I was, you know, I had this really skewed perception of what hip hop was. And then, you know, go to college. And I, that's when I found like, you know, MF doom and, uh, Quasimodo and the whole stones throw thing. And just Wu Tang had barely ever even heard Wu Tang before. And just like, yeah, had, had my mind kind of blown and, um, yeah. And, uh, so yeah, earliest stuff, definitely beastie boys, DMC run DMC. Oh, I was going to say I was really lucky because my parents like didn't have the most money and they never they were always afraid of not spoiling me. So I didn't have that much means as a kid. So when I went to buy music, it was at Walmart and I would have like 10 bucks. So I'd see like, there's the new, you know, I don't know, whatever, like, um, you know, there's the new, uh, Foo Fighters album and it's $18. So I can't afford that. But with my 10 bucks here at Walmart, I can get this corny ass compilation of like eighties hip hop. You know, and it's like whatever, like, you know, big boombox jams, number four, you know, Grandmaster <laughs> Flash presents, you know what I mean? And, it, and like this, these old school compilations of these hits from the 80s that they were repackaging. And so I would I'd be like, I oh, sure I'd throw my 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 10 bucks down on like a, a few of those. And so like because I was so isolated and out, out in the woods, I kind of accidentally learned about the roots of hip hop until I like, kind of caught up. And then I, it's almost as if in 2005, all of a sudden, boom, now we're in the present day. And I'd been living in the eighties the whole time, you know, like I was still listening to like Tupac, you know what I mean? Was like the most modern shit that I was playing. And, 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 um, so then it was all of a sudden, boom, I'm dropped right down in the middle of an actual cipher. People are like, you know, spitting multis and doing punchlines and wordplay and all the shit that we take for granted now. And I was like, wait, what the fuck is this? You know, I'm still over here rocking at the party. We rock the party. You know, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so it kind of blew my mind and, and, and projected me forward um, a, a great deal really fast. So and it, it, it's it's funny, this context of, you know, you wanting to reflect on my career as, as a battler. And it's like, well, half of it isn't even on camera. You know, I started battling in 2005 league didn't come out for four years after that so sure which, no, which is prob probably a good thing but it, it did happen you know what i mean it's like look i mean I, I was never the best but i was there so you know absolutely man and it's it's you know it that's the kind of thing that i, I do want to get into on this show as well it's it's more about it's more about everybody's experiences with battle rap as opposed to just sure discussing the modern era if that makes sense but it's it's a cool story man and like you said you you kind of discovered hip-hop and stuff a bit further when you you moved to columbia missouri like where where did you grow up then uh i grew up on a farm in an intentional community in the woods it's about an hour away from st louis and it's the middle of nowhere uh Technically, if you wanted to like Google it or whatever, there's a there's a village uh, close close by called Leesburg, Missouri, but it's like next to like state parks and um, like rivers and stuff. It's really just like the middle of this uh, 
big um, range of hills and woods that they call the Ozarks. So when people ask me where I'm from, I usually just say the Ozarks. You know, it's bumfuck. Okay. But uh, Makes sense. yeah, middle of nowhere on a little hippie commune. So, you know, got to hear a lot of cool music, uh, a lot of good like folk and, 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 and rock music through my parents and all their friends. But, you know, they didn't they didn't care about rap. So. Sure. And like. Was was going to college then the first time that you'd moved away from that area? Yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, I was I was on that farm for 18 years. Well, I, I, I well, I, I ran away from home uh, after my last day of high school because my because then I'd like done it. So my parents used to take in runaways and then one was staying with me that I started sleeping with and me and her moved into a trailer park at our drug dealer's house next to the train tracks the day after high school. So I lived a few towns over for like four months or so before I came up here and started college. So there's a little, there's like a, there's a half a year in between there, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you've, you've got a fascinating story, man. You really do. Like it's uh thank you. It's, it's very interesting to hear. And like was moving to, to kind of like a big town quite daunting at first then or oh absolutely just oh absolutely it? no on, on my first night i i used to eat a bunch of drugs and so like on my first night up here i was like oh no big deal deal just move in a, a different town and i ate a bunch of uh mushrooms with my, with my buddy and i was staying on my uh i was camping on my sister's porch with him because we didn't we came up here before the dorms were open so we were like oh we'll just couch surf or whatever and i ate a bunch of shrooms and I just had like a total breakdown. And then like my sister helped me through that or whatever, like pulled every lamp into the room, like every lamp in the house into one room and like cheered me up. She's really smart, got through the mushroom trip, but then the next day it just doesn't stop. And it's like a week of me being like manic and paranoid and just having a bad time. Because while I was always like welcoming of new experiences and willing to try anything and I'd done all this crazy shit, even by the time I was 18, at the same time, you go from a town of 127 people to 127,000 people, it's going to blow your mind. And I had not prepared myself at all. And instead of like exploring the neighborhood and like meeting, I was eating drugs. You know what I mean? So it's like I uh, it, it totally bugged me out and it continued to bug me out for for a while. Um, but uh, so I, I was always kind of just like the fish out of water, you know, and like um, – yeah, I always kind of just have played this role to go further into the identity piece of it all is like I've always been the punk rock kid at the hip hop shows and I'm the hip hop kid at the punk rock shows. So I've always been kind of in between. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah, now I see this. I'm still here. Uh, however many years later, 15 years later. And now I see this. Now I've traveled a good deal. I've spent a lot of time in Chicago and I see Columbia for what it is, which is just like a really nice, um, t small town, college town, you know, like I, I see it really differently now <laughs> I've adjusted. Sure. It only took a, it only took a decade and a half. Yeah, and you, um, you did mention yesterday as well that you're also, so you've, you've spent quite a lot of time hitchhiking around the States as well. Is that right? Yeah. I kind of, I kind of tapped into that earlier. Basically it was like, I was, yeah, touring, and then so I kind of had lost my job because I kept leaving to go to tour, and uh, I, like, uh, lost that girlfriend that I mentioned earlier that kind of had helped me get my life together, and I just was like, uh, I was like, well, I think I'll bottom out, you know, because um, I was like, I, I think I'll just, I think I'll just fuck everything up, and I was, like, saying this out loud, like, I, I'm bottoming out, it's, you know, I was, like, telling all my friends, uh, you know, quit my job I had and um, just uh, had my brother drop me off in Kansas City. Just no idea what I was doing. Just like, you know, big pack full of like baked beans and in a, in a, in a, in a sleeping bag on my back. And I the, the, the anecdote that everybody always likes hearing is basically I had a friend that was willing to be what you call a road dog, like my partner in travel. My friend was willing to be my road dog and hop trains with me. But he had left earlier and he was already in Denver and I was uh, in Kansas City, which is like a day's drive away from there. And I was like, he was going to leave Denver the next day and I'd kind of missed my chance to meet up with him. 
And so I gave up getting a ride to Denver and I started walking south of Kansas City and a car drove by and had seen me flying my sign that I had on my back that said Denver. I just pinned it to my to my to my pack because I was done holding it. And this lady was like, are you still trying to go to Denver? And I'm like, yeah, even though I'm walking the wrong way, I get her in her BMW. She drives me to her mansion. I meet her husband who owns a business in Denver and is flying his private, like single engine plane there right then. And we go to the the little airport private strip, get in his little plane that's like the size of a van. And he flies me to Denver and I get to call my friend and say, hey, don't ask me how, but I swear to God, I'm downtown in Denver. Come get me. And I get to meet up with him and uh, and do the rest of my travels all the way to California with him. That is absolutely incredible, man. I love it. It's it's so random and just Yeah, I'm I'm really lucky. Like I've done all I can to fuck up my life. And the universe keeps shining down on me and I'm like, hey, don't you get it? I'm trying to fuck up, you know? And like I I, I, I I'm 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 severely lucky. Like, seriously. Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a big part of it. So um yeah, and just continued to luck out, and, and, and you know, throughout my travels, like considering that I had no idea what I was doing, not a dollar in my pocket, uh, big ambitions, um, I, I still made it, you know. So um, I ended up getting a ride. I think I think I want to say it was over a thousand miles with a guy who, to be fair, was a friend of the guy I was with, but we found out that this guy who gave me a ride almost a thousand miles his grandpa had built had helped build the house i grew up in it was really weird that's crazy man yeah and going back to like the being able to to randomly find yourself in a place of catching a flight from yeah kansas city to denver like that, i feel like that you'd never meet somebody that would be willing to just take a chance and offer you that opportunity nowadays like i feel like it's for example like in in new zealand hitchhiking is quite a popular thing to do um my my stepdad's from new zealand and when mm. when we've been home to visit we've kind of drove around the country up like just to explore and whenever he spotted a hitchhiker he would pick them up and take them as far as we could kind of thing whereas I think it's now, I'm not 100% certain on this, but I'm pretty sure it's now been made illegal in New Zealand. Really? Um, and it's it's something that, it's kind of built up a bad reputation over, over the years and people are a mm. bit more paranoid to do things like that now. But do you think if, if someone was to attempt to hitchhike around, let's say from Kansas City to California now, do you think there's an, enough people that would be willing to help? I think there's always people that are willing to take a shot. I think that if I was, I, I, I can't recommend doing it. I think if you're if you're going to do it, you should absolutely have someone with you that's that's done that kind of thing a lot before. And like, if you're going to be sober enough, and you're gonna and you're gonna be safe, hopping trains is definitely the way to go. Like over counting on rides. Because what will happen is America is so big, you'll get dropped off in a, like a, a city. And if it's not a major city, you might get stuck in a small town for like days, you know, and they're not going to have like a soup kitchen and they're not going to have like resources that you're going to need, you know, um, and it's going to get real ugly. So you end up kind of just going crazy, you know, um, w when that shit happens. So you got to get people who are not only willing to give you rides, but give you to ri give you a ride to like the next city, which can be hours away, you know, so um it's tough but i'm i mean even though that was 10 years ago people were saying to us every ride we got people would say i can't believe you're doing this this used to be cool you know back in the 70s but i can't you know how is this working for you i can't believe you do this but i think there will always be a community that's like a subsect of the punk rockers that kind of like um emulate hobo culture and like you know just live this certain way I think there's less and less and less of that, but I think it'll always be there. 
Sure. But no, yeah, I, I think it does get harder and harder. Like the richer, the, the, the more money an area has, the more illegal it is too. So like Colorado just sucks. Like Colorado's beautiful and like one of the best places to travel to. But if you don't have money, I mean, they're, they're just so ready to throw you in jail, you know? Right. Okay. That makes sense. I, yeah. And I, I imagine California is very similar in that sense then. California is a little is a lot more liberal in general. From what I saw, somebody else might disagree, but like, I don't know. I where did I get stuck? I feel like where was I? I don't know. It just depends where you are in California, I guess. There were some cities where I think I just ended up in the wrong spot. I was like, uh oh, everything is looking swanky. People are looking at me weird, you know. <laughs> like, you just, you're just hoping for that one young hippie couple or whatever, but. Yeah, sure. most of, most of California, there's just so many whack, wackos out there. Anyway, there's just so many weird um, out there people. I think that they're less shocked to see it. Um, that was my experience anyway, but it doesn't mean they're going to pick you up. So. No, of course. And like in terms of your your travels around the states, then like where would you say are some of your favorite places? Because for for people from the UK, I don't know many people that have kind of ventured further than your New Yorks or your Miamis or your, you know, your your Los Angeles or places along those lines. It's people tend to stick to the, yeah. the big places or just going over to go to Disneyland, Florida right. or things like that. But where where are some of your favorite places that you, you went to on your travels? Uh, I definitely just love the Pacific Northwest, like um, up in, you know, uh, Washington and, and Oregon and like Northern California. There's this place um, called the Emerald Triangle, and I hope I'm not really blowing it up. I don't think it's that relevant anymore now that weed is like legal by and large, but it basically was the place where most weed came from in the world. And it's in way up in Northern California where there like aren't any people. It's just like mountains and, and, and woods and um, all these just giant trees that are hundreds of years old. And basically there's these like small communities in there where uh, like everybody's growing weed. It's actually like for some towns, it's the number one economic like producer or whatever. And like, Half the businesses you see are, are are fronts, but basically all like all these dirty kids and weird kids and musicians and you know like uh, any sort of um, outcast, any sort of societal outcast uh, that's a young person would like end up there to uh, help trim and cultivate the weed. And um, being there, um, especially the first time. I saw it back when weed was still illegal. I mean, it it was like, it was like, oh, this is what San Francisco in the 60s must have felt like. It's like, oh, this is where we all are, you know, as like a total weirdo, um, whatever, that's super into culture of all sorts. I'm just sitting there going like, oh, here we all are. This is where we're meeting up. And it's the middle of the woods, middle of nowhere. And it wasn't like there was a ton of like parties but when there was it would be like everybody was climbing out of their tent for the first time in weeks and like super excited to have human contact and like there'd just be like big you know dances and if a band was playing everybody be jumping around just uh exuberance of an unmatched proportion and uh good looking women and you know obviously a lot of weed to go around if that's your thing and I don't know if that exists anymore, but that was like the most fun I had was 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 being out there. And then just that whole area, even if you're not into being a weirdo and you're not into living on the street and other things I'm talking about, just a beautiful spot. You know, you have these like uh, you have these like hundred foot tall trees that come all the way to a beach and it just, you know, giant woods. It's where they filmed uh, Endor from Star Wars. OK, it, but OK, so imagine that and then it turns into a beach. With no transition, it's just boom. Then you're at the ocean, you know. So it's uh, it's surreal. It's beautiful. It's it, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And pe- so people people are nice I'm, and artsy. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure I've I've had a conversation about it before. So uh, I have a a friend from from high school who has now lived in. Well, quite close to San Francisco for the last sort of 
10 years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, I cannot remember for the life of me where he lives now. I want I want to say it's 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 called Napa or something along those lines. But um, yeah, Napa Valley. Potentially, it's it's about an hour or so north of San Francisco. Okay. Um, it, it quite close to Sacramento as well, but um, I'm pretty sure he's he's talked about the he's talked about having been there when he first kind of moved out there because he he's mentioned the emerald triangle to me anyway which is yeah it's it sounds incredible he's got a lot of he he brought back quite a few quite a few photos of camp in there and things like that so it's something that i'm aware of but yeah it's would you say that's your favorite place that you've been so far then? Cause I know you've not left the States either. Is that correct? Right. No, I haven't. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been to, I think f- I've spent the night in 40 of the 50 States, but I've never left them. So I have like thoroughly explained, explored America, but uh, I'm ready to start exploring the world as, as soon as I can. My, uh, I, I was telling you earlier, my girlfriend, she, she's, uh, she's lived on like, a handful of continents and she's an anthropologist. So she, she's been all over the, all over the world. But, um, so we're kind of opposites in that way. So I'm, I'm ready to join her on the Indiana Jones esque adventure any day now. But, um, yeah, Definitely, man. And it, uh, yeah. it'll be good fun. You mentioned that your, your plan is to go to kind of East Asia first, right? So that's yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna be incredible. Do you know where, where you plan to go? No, I don't. It's um, she does this thing where they pay her to do like a talk at at uh, different universities, and so she tends to go out there. They pay for her flight, and then she like hops over wherever's close to there, or you know, close-ish. So she kind of gauges where she's gonna vacation off of where she ends up due to uh, academia. So gonna wait and see. She wanted to go to. I can't. Okay, do you remember in Indiana Jones where they? In the Last Crusade, where they're at that, it's like a, it's like a, 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 a cliff face that has like a, like almost a castle built into it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, it's a really famous spot where it's like these dug into the walls, like um, columns, and it's like this big. Uh, and it's oh, explain. yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Petra in Petra. Jordan. Yes, she was going to take me there, and I guess the war got really, really bad. And they, every, like, so maybe we're not going there. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, yeah. have to, we'll have to see what happens with the violence um, when things get uh, more normal. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a good call at the moment. I mean, with the, the whole Israel Palestine thing, they're very close knit, and it's, yeah, maybe not the best time to go right now. But yeah, but she, I mean, she's, uh, she's, she, uh, she is Indiana Jones. She's uh she's lived in like South Africa and like the woods in China, and she's traveled to like countries that are like severely uh like religiously led w- where there is violence, and she like seems to manage by herself. So we might end up somewhere that's a little off the beaten path and a little dangerous, and I'm just gonna like hold on to her and do what she tells me to try to not get killed. <laughs> it's a good plan, man. Um, it's worked so no. far. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it'll be great for man. We um we went to Thailand for I think about five weeks last summer, and it was my my girlfriend. We we were kind of the opposite in that sense as well. So I, I've lived in a couple of different countries and fairly well travelled. I've kind of been through like backpacking through Europe and things like that. But she'd never really been abroad before apart from to go to like ireland and stuff which is culture wise it's not overly different yeah um so we test we, we've been on a few like city breaks around europe since we've been together so amsterdam and budapest and places like that but that's we cool. decided to uh to test the waters properly and head over to thailand and we went to I, I think about nine different places in total. Uh, so oh. traveled all along the coast and all the islands and things. And it was, it was incredible, man. You're, you're going to have a, a great time wherever you go in that part of the world. So 
Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I know, and I know she's excited to blow my mind. You know, definitely because it's I. I know it's going to be unlike anything else when you know when I when I go. So I'm ready. But yeah, it's it's. I was going to say it. It's funny because I I think in Europe in general, like backpacking in your 20s is still seen as a pretty normal thing to do. Like you hear about it. And when I would tell people that I was like, they'd be like, what do you do? I'd be like, I'm a traveler. I'm just traveling for a while. Like they would not know how to handle that. That, that was, that was a foreign concept to them. You know, it's just not a thing people really do. No, I, I, I can imagine. But I mean, in, in a sense that I guess in Europe, there's so even though everything's very close together, you you can probably cross six or seven borders in a 12 hour drive. Um, but culturally it's all very different experiences. Whereas I guess I'm sure you get a lot of cultural differences between States and things in America, but it's as a whole, you know, everything is, is similar in that. I guess a lot of people have have similar hobbies or maybe even down to watching similar shows and and things like that, if that makes sense. But oh, yeah, it's it's really homogenized. Like there's definitely basically in different parts, people will be slightly less or more friendly. You know, um, they'll they'll want to talk more or less. It'll be more normal to talk, you know, more. Um, But beyond that, I mean, you could. I can imagine like one of these famous rock bands with a private jet getting dropped off in a city in America, not having any idea what city they're in, you know, like I've heard that's kind of a joke and it's like, I get it because basically everywhere is everywhere looks just about the same, which is really sad uh, to me. Um, But uh, yeah, there's just minor differences. Definitely. No, I I can see that. And then, yeah, I mean, with with Europe, it's it's a very easy it's very easy to backpack around Europe. You know, I think the longest the longest journey in between places that I had was between when when I started the trip. So I was living in central Germany at the time, mm. and I wanted to start from Budapest um, just because it was kind of the furthest east that I wanted to go. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it took two trains and a coach and took maybe 16 hours. Yeah. Um, and then from there, it was all just small two to four hour journeys around Europe until I eventually made it back to Germany kind of thing. And it's, travel within europe it, it's definitely gone up now it, it's quite expensive to do now but mm. i did this maybe six years ago or so and it was I, I did it for roughly about a month and it i i like i could kind of get a coach from for example budapest to uh, vienna for about six dollars maybe whoa yeah so it was it was super cheap whereas nowadays it, it it's definitely nowhere near as cheap and most people prefer to do it by train because it's much quicker and comfortable but it's definitely worth doing if you ever get the chance to go across europe it's uh it, it is incredible man but i i definitely will i definitely will um it just might take a few years but yeah, I mean, how I survive in such a small town now is I, I take the train to Chicago like every month and go into St. Louis, you know, every, like every couple of weeks, um, which is pretty inconvenient. But it, it keeps me sane, you know, keeps their, you know, get to still go to events and everything. Sure. And so, do you know yeah. what? I think Chicago is is one of the one of the top places on my list that I'd like to go to in the States, actually, it looks, it looks amazing. And Chicago's wild. Yeah. Yeah. And people, I'm, people are nice too. People are really friendly in general in Chicago. Yeah. I mean, so, except for the ones that'll shoot you. There's severe gang problems. There's like a gang war happening. But besides that, ah, great people. 
<laughs> Besides but the gang warfare. From from what you know, for, from an outsider looking in, I've never been to the states, unfortunately. But from what we hear over here, it's similar in in most big cities in the states, right? As far as the violence, or just how people act beyond that? I mean, in in terms of yeah, the the violent side of things, every city uh, has that. Um, they do. Um, except um, New York, you can't uh, have a gun, uh, or, or you can't like uh, the laws are they they and there's also more surveillance. I don't know all the details. I'm just a Midwestern kid, but um, I think they keep their crime down by having more severe laws. And in Chicago, it's like um, it's an epidemic. Uh, it's uh, from from what I understand, it's it's being removed from it myself. It's a it's a pretty severe problem in Chicago, um, more so than other places. Sure. OK. Yeah. Well, yeah. But like the, um, L.A., I've been to uh, 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 like South Central Los Angeles, um, you know, when I was traveling, like when I came through California, like the second or third time and like was, you know, on like Crenshaw Boulevard by myself around midnight like a f- fucking idiot with like a camera around my neck and like nothing happened, you know, but, um, there's, uh, cause I think like, I think in general, what I've learned is if you're minding your own business, then you're all good. But I think that Chicago is one of the more dangerous parts of the world from what I understand. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, this might sound a bit strange, but the main reason that I wanted to go, I want to go to Chicago so much is, um, I became a few years ago, became a really big fan of a TV show called the league. If you're aware of it, I know that Nick Kroll is on it and I love Nick Kroll, but I've never watched the league. Right. Yeah. Nick Kroll is, he, he's very good in it, but, um, it's, it's a bit of a bizarre story because I'm, probably the only person in the uk that i know that sat down and watched this show Uh um the only reason that i started watching it was because i remembered seeing john lejoey on youtube as a kid with his like parody rap tracks that he was doing and seeing that he was on this show and just thought that i'd give it a go Uh i knew nothing about american football at the time um but just became a huge fan of it i thought it was hilarious and it's okay. it's filmed in chicago and just it just looks incredible just for, just from watching that really and it's kind of been top of my list since there's there's quite a few quite a few rappers and stuff from chicago that i'm a big oh, fan yeah. of as well so that that's influenced it too but yeah I mean, the, the the stereotypical places that most Brits go to if they come to America have never appealed to me in that sense. I mean, mm-hmm. I think Florida looks like my worst nightmare, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's ours too. Yeah, if you're not from Florida here, we, we, we avoid it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Where, it's where criminals go to start over. That's what Florida is. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't look up my street at all. But um, Vegas just does not appeal to me whatsoever um i I like going somewhere that if we're going on holiday i like to explore like the history of the place and stuff as well and oh well chicago chicago's cool uh i I would recommend the mafia museum um because that's that whole city was run by organized crime for like uh over a decade and yeah uh, so that's interesting to me um yeah, I really enjoyed that, and it's uh, it's right downtown. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. I was gonna say when I first when I first went up to Chicago, it would have been like five six years ago, or for, you know first time as a music fan to, to to like actually enjoy the the music scene and everything. I went up there and I was getting interviewed for like a podcast at this like practice space, and it, first of all it was it was an entire I don't want to say skyscraper, but it was like an eight story building, and it was all practice spaces. That people were like recording podcasts and playing in bands and like recording rap albums in it was like the whole building. And I was like, OK, that makes sense. But I had never thought of it. And then the guy recording us on the podcast, there was like a line like he was 
doing like 10 people in a row. And so I literally was standing in line to record the podcast. And the dude next to me was like, uh, you know, what are you doing in town? And I was like, oh, I'm, uh, I film uh, battle rap events. And he was like, you do. And then we battled and he was amazing at freestyling. And like, I was like, I'm waiting in line, having a better rap battle than I have in a year in Col- in my hometown, just at a, at a random place with no one watching and nobody filming. I was like, all right, Chicago's pretty cool. Chicago's pretty cool. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I'm, um, I'm hoping to someone that I know you're aware of just from, you know, watching some of the interviews that you've done yourself yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to be getting Sam. I am the MC on the show. Oh yeah. Well, Sam goes way back and he, uh, like me, I think him as a host and an organizer has contributed a lot more than his material, even, even though his material is worth it as well. But, um, you know, he, he, he's at the center of a, of just a booming scene there. I mean, they, they got, they got shit going on like once a week, twice a week. That's just like crazy, you know, like freestyle workshop type, you know, situations. It, it, it's great. You know, the stuff that he does. Definitely. And it, it's it, it it the show's become really fascinating in that sense because like just just from the stories that he's or the things that he's been involved in that he's mentioned to me just while setting up getting him on the show like it's it's completely unheard of for us over here in the UK like anybody any any battle rapper will say they just kind of found out about it enjoyed it found out about it through like the WRCs or jump off yeah. or d- even don't flop and right. enjoyed it, thought they'd give it a go and have been to an event every two months ever since kind of thing. And that that's, that's right. kind of it. It's a very niche scene over here. Whereas I feel in the States, just the hip hop culture as a whole is, is a huge thing. And over here, it really isn't. I think we're one of the only countries in the world where hip hop isn't one of the top three genres of music that makes the mainstream radios and things. So it's it, it's very inaccessible here, and yeah. to the point where we we have some a, a genre of music in the UK at the moment, which is it's basically drill music. Mm-hmm. Um, we, they call it like UK road rap, I think, but it's it it's kind of Chief Keef esque. Is, is sure. the best the best way I can describe it. But it's um it's actually been banned. So I, I heard artists, I was hearing about that. Yeah, so most artists that are kind of categorized into that genre of music can no longer get, get booked to do shows and things mm. um and if if any shows do go down because there's there's some big artists involved because it is a really popular genre of music over here so like there's two guys called crept and conan who are they're, they're very big like they've done shows in in the u.s and sold out big venues kind of thing and it's mm. They're a big deal. They have TV shows where they, I think they did a show called like Rap Game UK where they were finding young grime artists from around the country and getting mm-hmm. them to compete against each other. And like they're, they're, they're very successful in that sense. And their, their shows are still just about allowed to go on, but only because they're they're kind of doing the O2 arena, which is like maybe 50,000 people and like huge arena tours. Whereas any smaller venue, the, if they somehow bypass it and get the event to happen, the police will turn up and lock it down almost instantly. Uh, wow. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult over here and we, we don't get, we don't get, I think, as many hip hop shows over here either as we we potentially could. I think it's always been quite difficult for. I know Freddie Gibbs was denied entry into the UK when he was meant to do a show here. 
Um, there's been quite a few rappers in recent years that have been denied entry. So for us, it's it's always fascinating to hear how big the scene really is over there and how it's just kind of a part of regular culture. Like Sam, Sam I am the MC was saying that he, he, there's been times where he's just been walking down the street and people will challenge him to, to like a battle there and then. And like yeah. that to us, that's completely unheard of in that sense. Yeah. I, th- I think things are a little less like that than they used to be because there's a bigger platform now and sure. it used to be and my take always was that being from the midwest we were a little behind of the times and i was lucky to be stuck in that time capsule because like nobody told us that this era of hip hop was dead i i think that i think that by and large in like new york and la and like all the other major scenes like where they're ha- in miami and all that i think there had been a lot of battles because you had to get your your word out there. You had to get word of the mo- word of mouth going, and you had to get that rep, you know. And so people would freestyle and, and do those cipher battles and do those street battles. And then, you know, like um, you know, LimeWire and 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 all these websites, you know, and websites show up, and like it just the the power of um, distribu- distribution got into the hands of the rappers. And so all those major cities, that stuff wasn't as important because now if you're a rapper in New York, you can you can set up you can have your friend bring a camera and you can do a smack battle and then boom, that, that DVD is distributed all through your neighborhood and like you're set. Everybody knows you can battle. You don't have to battle every week now. But then like being here in the sticks and being in the Midwest and I think Chicago was a little bit a part of this is like things were just a little behind, like we didn't get the memo. And so when I came into the scene in like 05, 06, we were all still freestyle battling each other. You know, nobody thought to pull a camera out for a few years. And so we still kind of had to prove it. And I think that that has still carried over a little bit in Chicago, especially where it's like, OK, we know we could just organize a battle, but like. Can you keep it real? You know, there's like this old mindset of like keeping the guard and uh, keeping things how they're like supposed to be um, where you can battle someone on the spot. So I used to feel uh, ashamed to be from where I am because it's not one of like the not known as like one of the epicenters of hip hop. But now that I see things in a bigger sense through talking to people like you, especially is like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be where I am. And it's actually good to be a few years behind because there's just still all this stuff happening. It's we don't have to wait for a camera to go on. You know, I'll still freestyle battle somebody. Definitely, yeah, man. And it's you know we're I I especially would have loved to have grown up kind of with that with with just that culture available to me in that sense. Like it's over here if you're. I remember when I was in high school and I I first around the time that I was getting, you know, really kind of obsessed with hip hop. And like I was really into grime music over here at Mm -hmm. the time. And when when I first started to like trying to rap and things and like telling people that I've I've started rapping or whatever, that like it, it was something that I would get taken the mick out of for, for by pretty much everybody. Nobody, mm. I, I'm from quite a small city in that sense anyway. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's even less accepted than it would be in, you know, your big cities like London or Manchester. I think you'd probably right. get away with it there, but it's, well, it's I, just I, never taken think, off here. Really. I think things have changed too. Um, just me being, you know, like me being a little older and, and like when I started rapping, I would, it would have been, you know, 0203. And like there, there were not any, uh, hip hop was popular. Rap was everywhere, but like, uh, there wasn't really any white rappers, like besides Beastie Boys and Eminem, you know, every, there was years, it was five, six years that every battle I got into somebody would call me Eminem, you know? Um, and then kind of like Macklemore happened and, and, um, you know, all the, all these other guys, Macklemore was like the second white rapper is like what it felt like when that, when that happened. 
And now it's just, you don't even think about it. And now there's like, you know, a million, right? And I think things are, things have changed even from when I was a kid. And um, I don't know if you know, but I'm a, I'm a drug counselor for teenagers. Okay. And um, I work with them and I, um, you know, we do these groups um, and um, I get to spend a, a good deal of time with them. So it's, it's not always like all business. We get to talk about what is like fun as well. And like, you know, just hang out. And a lot of those guys rap and it's, and it doesn't matter if they're white, you know, like it is, it is, I think more normal than ever to be a rapper. Like every other kid is a rapper and it's like every other white kid is a rapper too. I think that things have changed not only in people's perception of like what it means to be white in hip hop. I think people will change perception of what it means to be into hip hop because I think it's basically the new rock and roll. And, in, and I also think that with SoundCloud and the way artists are seen, it's more normal than ever to just declare yourself an artist. Because I think when I started in 03, I think it wasn't just, oh, you're white. It's like you don't have a record label. You don't have people backing you. You don't have a crew. You don't have anything calling this official. Nobody said that you can do this and somebody needs an, an, an organized outside authority needs to declare that this is okay for me to believe that you can rap. And I think that's what draws people and drew me into the underground scene where battling could give you a name, freestyling could give you a name, you know, being part of this like underground backpacker thing was like a way to establish yourself. But I can only imagine if I started now, I think I would end up doing more what my punk rock did, which was to be like a really artsy, expressive, um, more like, um, emotional intellectual emphasis over just competitiveness and, and technicality. You know what I mean? I, I think that influenced needing to carve a space, but I think that myself and, and, and just the whole scene has carved a space now where a 16 year old can say I'm a rapper. And he basically has as much authority to do that as like, you know, a little peep or an NLE chopper or something. Definitely. No, I can see what you mean. And it's, it is slowly getting more accepted over here as well in that That's sense, good. but it's, um, yeah, definitely back then, like, it, it, you know, as soon as I, I kind of, e even talking to just my close friends at the time and saying, like, I've started writing to, to become a rapper kind of thing, that I'd instantly be labelled like a wigger or something like that. Like, it, mm -hmm. it's just, people have a very negative view of it over here, but yeah. it's... Um, it, it's starting to improve. I'm not sure if you're aware of a guy called Stormzy, who is mm -hmm. a grime artist over here, who he's he's become massive. I think he's, to my knowledge, he, he's very popular in the States as well, because like recently he's been on like Hot 97 for an interview and like oh, cool. Charlemagne the God got him on his his podcast and flew him out to the states to do it kind of thing so i'm guessing he's he's getting big over there as well but he's That's um cool. he's recently headlined glastonbury which is kind of the go, go to festival in the uk um, cool. and that's always been heavily overrun by you know the headliners have always been your, your foo fighters or your mm -hmm. Um, like Snow Patrols or Oasis, the Arctic Monkeys yeah. bands like this. So that was very kind of big to us at the time. Um, and I think it, it seems to have pushed things further. It sounds like sounds the, the rumours are that Pusha T is going to be headlining a big festival over here this year, which is... is there's smaller festivals that have been booking hip hop artists, but for the main ones like Glastonbury, that's kind of a big deal. Um, mm. So it it's slowly getting there, but I think I think we're similar to like the area that you're from in the sense that we're we're just very behind and yeah yeah it's hopefully it improves quickly because it needs to over here unfortunately, but. Like in terms of no coast, then so obviously you've been involved since the beginning, but 
what are some of your personal favorite events that no coast have put on oh favorite events i'm i'm super biased but we we had the 10th anniversary here in columbia uh last summer and it, it, it was like it was it was magic because um like you pointed out i think like us having fun and there not being that same tension or seriousness is like what sets us apart it's like our best element and so i basically booked an event that was like we don't expect a crowd and we didn't even charge the crowd um and it, it, it just like did uh day two in a park during the day and we had the source versus xqz and it was just like hey show up let's have a good time it'll just be us you know and it was just like just that very like in group kind of feeling which i think is what's funny because like the whole time we've always done stuff that it's like we use inside jokes and do stuff that we think is funny. And it seems like the further we go with not caring what other people will think, the more popular that video is. Like, I don't know what it is. People, like it helped build a, build a, a mythos or something. Um, sure. But that's definitely my favorite event just because it was like, I just went in knowing, I, knowing I would uh, lose money and just being like, whatever, I'm going to set up some dream matches. And it's, going to be like for us and it's going to be amazing and it's going to be you know our champion versus the saurus you know like this historic you know thing so that that felt great but um all the um all the valentine's day massacres have been crazy in chicago like our top five all of our top five most viewed battles on the channel are from a vdm event there's been six of them no more seven i don't know i can't keep track <laughs> Um, yeah, favorite events. God, I don't know. I've hosted, I've been saying that I've hosted a hundred event over a hundred events for two years now. So I want to, I want to say I've hosted like 120, 130 events by now. Um, Crazy. so it's kind of hard to, to, to pick a favorite one. Um, no, of course I, I, yeah. I can appreciate that. Sometimes, like, I don't know, up, up in Minneapolis, just working with Breakneck, like, he's my age, and he's been booking, like, pretty large-scale hip-hop shows for so long, like, before battling, and, like, that it always goes really smoothly there. I know that every time I've, I've filmed and helped host up there, it's just been, like, you just get it done. It's like, boom, you know what you're doing. It stays on schedule. It's perfect. And then in Chicago, there's just so many people. We'll, like, pack a house, and it'll just be wild energy in the air so it's a little more like unpredictable st louis is always like more laid back st louis is definitely like more of like a grimy town which is like my kind of thing i like that um and um damn man i don't know favorite event it was pretty wild having bowski and canal and mickey worthless out and everything that was that was pretty nuts that was in minneapolis and that that was uh, hilarious just because we fed them all acid and they were like their minds were blown. And I just remember like we were standing on a street like, you know, half an hour outside of the city. And they were like, I can't believe this is where hip hop is from. And I was like, this isn't exactly where hip hop is from. Like, you're, <laughs> you're kind of in the woods here. You know, like, I, I didn't know how to I don't want to let them down. But I was like, they're a little they're a little skewed um, with their vision. And uh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've had some. Yeah, had some good events. I actually hosted events for. Um, I hosted events for four years. I hosted written battles before I went to an event that I wasn't running myself. Okay. Yeah. So I've still only been to like three, three or four written battle events that. I didn't have a role in myself that I wasn't like in charge of helping film or organize or something. That's really cool. Or, or, or cool. battling at. Yeah. What were the, what were the events that you were, you were hosting before no coast then? Uh, I hosted a lot of parties um, and a lot of, like I would have punk bands come through and um, yeah. So I guess it, I guess it started with, I, when I was 15 I would rent out the community center called the Knights of Columbus Hall, which we called the Cock Hall. And, and I would in, in Bourbon, Missouri, you know, just the middle of nowhere. And kids would drive from all over, like 
kids would drive from like hours around just out in the sticks to like come and uh, see these these punk bands and like these pop punk bands or whatever. And um, and uh, by the way, that's when I was making the most money off of events. I'd make like two hundred dollars per event and get to pay my own band as well and all the other bands. And it's all been downhill f- from there. But yeah, then I moved to Columbia and I was hosting punk bands at a house called South Anarchy, which was on South Ann Street. Then I ran a house venue called Red Wall and we had more like DJs and that's when the hip hop started kind of creeping in. And then I helped run an open mic that was the longest running open mic in town at a place called the Blue Fugue, which is pretty legendary just from having like like people would just do like rails of coke off the bar and like women would just take their shirts off and like had all these instruments that were like super dusty and, and, and grody just hanging on the walls everywhere. And it was just a unique bar. But anyway, we had an open mic that would have rap and punk rock and odd things at it. And I hosted that for four years. Um, okay. Yeah. So, and then, um, yeah. And then uh, even outside of no coast while no coast was going on, I hosted the mid Missouri rock and roll award show for a few years um yeah i've just i've just done rent you know odds and ends of hosting gigs that's, that's a really brief, cool one brief brief yeah. rundown yeah nice and um you know what do you say like it, it i could i i knew it would be a hard question to answer when i asked what your your favorite events that you've put on with no coach star but the so for example there you mentioned the so the event that you did in your your hometown recently that with the Soros and XQZ so the 10 year anniversary I think I assumed that that was at a different event so that was that was the same event where like human battled Isaac Knox then is that correct yeah that was the other headliner yeah right okay so and that's that's at our punk space that's our space called PDM where my band practices and like all the punk uh, stuff happens. We've got a really, really solid, like what I would call like art punk movement going on here. Columbia has always had a really solid um, rock scene, like ever since the eighties. Okay. And yeah, the the venue looks really cool, man. There's a lot of like art, like you said, and graffiti and things like dotted around the venue and stuff. So, is that is that somewhere you spend a lot of time then? Oh yeah, I was just there when I was chatting with you yesterday. That's where I recorded my round for Bowski for this online tournament. And um, yeah, I got a practice space there because it's like it's a it's a big warehouse, and then on the sides are uh, three different um, practice rooms for different bands. And there's there's yeah, some of the bands that play there are just like amazing. Um, it's me, Ross, Rifle Cult, uh, Cowgirl, Jordy. Stuff that's on my channel that I, I mean, I listen to those bands just like I do, you know, Radiohead or Nirvana. I mean, they're just in my rotation. Like, yeah, um, it's a solid place. My friend Nate runs it, who I was in Task Force with, the, the punk band that toured. He's run it for like five or six years now, which is pretty unprecedented. Like at this point, the cops have to know about it and they just don't care. So right. it's pretty cool. And he's working to slowly bring in more rap shows. Because, I mean, you know, as you know, cops and most people in America are really racist and events that are like black teenagers and black young people are way more likely to get shut down than us doing some hipster punk rock thing. You know, Um, not that we aren't a welcoming crowd, like it's a pretty diverse crowd there for the rock shows, but uh, we're slowly creeping in over the last couple of years, these rap shows and just kind of hoping that that doesn't catch the eye of the cops. But. It's I think it's really cool that, you know, Nate and I have discussed it at length and he, he's he's willing to go down for it. You know, he's like, look, if you know, he's like, I'm here to provide a space. And if, if if cops have a problem just because there's black kids here, then that's going to be something we got to deal with. So he's he's pretty down for the cause. Yeah, no, that's that sounds fun, man. And it's like just. You know, you said that the the city that you're you're in at the moment is is pretty small, like yeah. around the a hundred thousand yeah. kind of thing, and it's it's good to hear that there's there's still people like yourselves putting on a scene for people there as well. So 
yeah, that, I, I'm sure those events are always really fun, man. But the that events are the the event where human battled Isaac Knox. So you battled at that event as well, right? Against um, was it Paranormal? Yeah, against Isaac, who's a buddy of mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. which, which, which was really funny because I, I'd been filming, I'd like was filming all night and then I had to like hand the camera over and I like st- stood in the hall for a minute going, okay, I can be me. I can do this. And then like walked back out and I was like, okay, I'm a battler now. You know, it's like a real big mode switch from, you know, kind of k- keeping it all together and, r- you know, running a tight ship to then like, all right, and now I'm going to yell mean things at this guy. No, I know. It was what I was about to ask, actually. So you very rarely see people that or event organizers or promoters battle at their own events. Oh, I is it something yeah. you find very stressful? Yeah, I highly recommend against it. And yeah. I, had, I had sworn it off and it. Uh, yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I think I just I don't know. I just wanted to. Have a, I wanted to put together like a nostalgic card and I wanted to represent like the, the talent in, in our town and the talent in our town is basically like bone man, my brother mantra and me. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm battling, you know? So yeah, I just dedicated to it. The crazy part about that. And like, I came into this interview knowing, knowing I'd come off as someone who just is trying to make myself sound badass, but I guess that's what it is. But um, the crazy thing about that battle is I was talking to Isaac The night, I want to say two nights before, and I was like, hey, I just want you to know that I have three five-minute rounds that I wrote, and they're they're all clocking over five now that I'm, like, doing them out loud. I was like, I've got three rounds, and they're all comfortably over five minutes, and I just – I don't know what length of rounds you wrote because we never discussed it. And he was like, dude, I'm not trying to hear that. He he was nice, but he was just like, dude – you're at least going first if that's the case. And if there's any way to not do that, that'd be great. So I actually spent like the following day cutting material out so I could get down to just have three and four minute rounds. So like, it's funny cause I spent 10 years writing battles the night before. And then I finally did one where I actually prepped, which was against drop, which is by far my best battle. It's the only one you should really watch honestly is me versus drop. But then basically I, I prepped again. I, I, I wrote months ahead of time. And then there I was editing the night before yet again. Okay. And I, I, I kind of disagree with what you said there. There's a couple of battles that I've personally really enjoyed. Like the, thanks. The two on two that you did against Nestle and Moss Jelton was just really fun. Um, there's... That was cool, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a cool battle. That that was arranged like the uh, that day or the night before. I wrote that like in the car up to Chicago. It was like right. I guess I guess we're doing this, and I like interviewed Ness, and then I was like, okay, let's battle now. <laughs> and he like <laughs> like went in the garage with Mosh for thirty minutes, and then we did it. Like, man, he said I had a purple m- mohawk at the time that like flopped in front of my face, like I didn't put it up. And he says, for one, I think you look like Lola from Futurama. And that's like the most clever thing anybody's ever said to me. And he came up with it in like half an hour before it was yeah. time to go. It's crazy. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I I really like the other two on two that you've done with uh, with Mantra against. It wasn't on No Coast. Um Oh, uh, against Breakneck in reality, maybe? Yes. Yeah, I think that's the one. I can't remember what league that was on, but... That was I think a league, I, yeah. That was called Loud House. I came Loud across House. that recently. That was it, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I came across that just kind of researching a few more battles before we did this interview, and it, that that was quite fun as well. That was fun to watch, but that was um, that was a while ago, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was uh you know seven or eight years ago now but uh yeah uh that one was cool because um it was in the record store that's owned by um the record label that puts out uh like atmosphere like slug and uh and all them i can't remember what it's called 
But oh, um, is it uh, not rhymes? Rhyme sayers. Yeah, rhyme sayers. Yeah, it was okay. like that. It was at the rhyme sayers headquarters, and oh, so wow. um, it was like uh, it just was like a you know a, a spot with a lot of hip hop history, and I was really happy to get a chance to battle there. And um, then somebody had said that uh, AC alone and uh, some of the guys from Project Blowed were going to be there because like they had a show that night or something, and so I'd heard that. And so I wrote in like a part where I talked to AC alone and then um, and then he like wasn't there. <laughs> and so I like just did it to the camera and played it off normal. But yeah, um, in that battle, I think like some other ones, I think like crowds don't know how to take me because I'm writing a line between joking and not joking. Like I'm saying like basically everything I'm saying is like very tongue in cheek. You know, it's not like sarcastic but I'm just being weird and loud. And so when I think of that battle, I always think about how like um, the first thing I say is I get in reality's face and I'm like five unreleased battles and like everybody laughs and then I keep yelling at them and everybody's quiet. Like I'm happy with my material, but it's a really dead crowd because they're like, wait, who is this? It was, do they know that they're being weird? And uh, I think that over the years, I, I finally learned to kind of look at the crowd and be like, hey, I know I'm weird. Sure, no, and it, it, I, I found it a really fun battle to watch anyway, and like, cool. that is, that's an incredible story, man, that you got to battle in, like, the Rhyme Sayers headquarters kind of thing, like, the, yeah, yeah, some of the artists signed to Rhyme Sayers are, like, some of my favourite artists in, the, like, ever, man, like, I'm a huge Aesop Rock fan, for example, and, oh, yeah, like, mf doom and evidence and people like that like that's that's incredible but yeah aesop is a huge influence of mine there were years where people would hear me and they'd be like oh aesop yeah <laughs> i guess i am ripping him off <laughs> not at all but, but in terms of your music like there's you're regularly working on projects right your your band camp is you know, there's so many projects available for like to to listen to on there. Like, how often my, are you? Did you see my second Bandcamp? <laughs> did you see Kellybets two dot Bandcamp dot com? I started I a B-side, I started a B sides collection. I'll have to send it to you. Yeah, I had so many on my Bandcamp. I was like, it's cool. I'm doing this thing, but like, it's overwhelming, you know. And like, some projects are stronger than others. That's just how it goes. So, but yeah, I uh, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm always working on two projects at once, at least. And I've always got something on the back burner. I've always just been like an idea guy. Um, I'm about to have album number 24 come out. That's crazy, man. And is that all within the last decade then? Uh, well, the weird part is I started making music when I was 17. And 17, 18... Uh, I put out a ton of music. I put out um, like four albums a year um, when I was a, a kid, basically. And then I, I got really into uh, just drinking and, and, and drugs and selling weed and stuff. And um, so I would battle. It wasn't like I was not active because I was still going to open mics and doing all the things we talked about. Like I was still active in music, but I wasn't recording. And the crazy part is from the time I was 20 until I got sober when I was 27, I only put out one tape that whole time. So okay. not only do I have 24 albums, but there's also seven years where only one album comes out. So I was able to kind of cheat in, in, in production of music because when I got sober, I'd, I'd been performing and writing music and like amassing all this material for years without um, recording anything. So I just had this huge uh, back catalog, basically. I just had all this stuff like half finished. And so the first year or two of sobriety was just me finishing all these projects I've been working on the whole time that I was drunk, you know? And, um, and then once I got finished putting out the material that I'd written um, that I'd never recorded, I kind of was in love with this idea of a weird guy that puts out four albums a year. Like I, I, I fell in love with the idea of putting out too much music, you know? Right. Um, I actually am lucky enough to like give guitar lessons and, and rap lessons um, as part of being a drug counselor. Um, okay. 
because you can use that as like a coping skill. And, you know, there's, it's a great way to open up to express yourself and share th some things. And it's just like also like just a positive alternative to, to getting loaded. Right. Um, and so something I teach when, cause these kids will like be stuck, but they like, they won't like the ideas they're having or they won't think they'll think it's not good enough. And something I find myself always saying is what if you tried the wrong thing? What would the wrong thing look like? What if you did the opposite of what you should do? And that's an idea that I've really gotten caught on for a long time. Um, I have been caught on for a long time, which is just like uh, just breaking the rules, basically, and doing the wrong thing. And I, I think that it's um, it's got this weird allure to it for me. Like just I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I love the idea of somebody stumbling on one of my songs and going this is good and then discovering that i have like too much music like more music than you could ever listen to and i don't know yeah it's uh if you want to get intellectual about it it's maximalism but that's yeah, sure that's what i'm into and, and that's not to say that i don't try i mean i really i mean god you could ask my girlfriend i put so many hours into this it's it's an obsession honestly you know but uh i, I love every song I put out, I don't put it out if I don't love it, but man, I got, I got quite a few songs. I think I have a, 150 songs published by now. Crazy like man. That. And it, yeah, it's, I, I didn't realize you had the second bank camp by the, yeah. but just looking at the first one, like it's, there's a good, I, I think there's 12 albums up on there if, if I'm not wrong, but yeah, it's, they're all they're all fairly recent as well, and I know you've just you've just put out a quarantine album that's not on there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that went straight to the um to the number two, Kelly Betts two. Uh, okay. Doc Van Camp. Right. Yeah, that that went straight there. there. Yeah, just because I, I like it, but I don't know. I like to I like yeah. I don't know. It wasn't. I I'm not as excited about it as I am this next thing I'm working on. Which is an absurdist pop album. <laughs> have you right. heard? A, okay. Have you heard? A, and um, well, go ahead. <laughs> no, sorry, go on, man. Have you heard a hundred Gex? The, no. A hundred Gex. Oh man, it's wild. It's like ringtone music in a blender with like. I don't know, like EDM and ska. It's just like ugly and weird and like the worst elements of pop music um, mixed with like harsh electronic alternative. And uh, as soon as this quarantine, quarantine thing, as soon as this whole situation started popping off, I found them at the same time and it just like overrides my brain. It's like oh, too, over stimulus. And I've always loved that. You know, I'm a huge fan of Velvet Underground. You know, the whole psychedelic movement grew up with all that punk rock. And I just love the idea of being overstimulated. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. So basically, since there's this amazing group that no one else is like, I'm like, I'll just rip this off. So I've been putting a lot of time into this uh, album I'm making called Everything You Never Wanted. Okay. And it's a, it's a pop album where I'm yelling half the time. It's it's really annoyingly catchy. Uh, I'm really excited about it. I think that. People are going to be confused by it, and I'm sure there's one or two people that have only ever heard me as a rap artist, and they're going to hear this and like unsubscribe, you know. But again, I, uh, I you know, I I do things that I'm happy with, that I'm excited about, and I I love exploring um, doing the absolute wrong thing. And this is definitely the wrong time for a pop album, so I'm doing it. Sure, I like it, man, and I'll. Uh... I'll be sure to check it out on uh, on my end anyway. But one of the one of the segments that I'm going to be doing on this show once I've kind of built the subscribers up and things and have an audience to to push it to is I want to put some work into promoting battle rappers music more. I feel like there's a lot of I feel like even in the states as well, actually, like over here though, that there's so many battle rappers that make very good music that, oh, that people no longer check out. Um, so I'm I'm gonna be slowly making my way through your uh, your Bandcamp collections and uh, okay, I'll, uh, I'll I'll definitely be including some stuff, man. But check is out the, the Radiohead one. I, 
people seem to like the Radiohead one. It's called Hail to the Computer Thief. No, Hail okay. to the Computer Kid. I can't even keep my album straight. Hail to the Computer Kid. I took uh, I took uh, drum breaks from Radiohead songs, and then I um, excuse me, I bit crushed them with an old uh, Roland 404 drum machine from the 80s. I like okay. old school, just crushed them, just. Uh, and then I rapped over that, and it's a good blend of like punk attitude and, and traditionalist, um, more um, like uh, skill based hip hop, you know. Um, but yeah, people seem to like that one a lot. It's good, and it's got you know it's got some emotional uh, elements to it as well. So yeah, okay. that's, I'll, yeah. Uh, I'll be sure to check that one first then, man. But um, in terms of so at the moment, in terms of of guests that I've got lined up no coast wise um so obviously there's been a big announcement this week in that no coast has now branched out into a new england uh like wow well, the eccm has basically become a no coast division in new england right, right. um how did Which that is, come about well I, I just yeah i think like um well, first of all, I think that's like all credits go to, to to those guys, to the ECCM guys and, and Shake, and that I, that's 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 really, I think Shake would be a much better authority on the details of it. But what I can do is kind of contextualize historically um, how No Coast has worked, and and I, honestly, like I don't know, after talking to you last night, I just kind of decided to openly frame it this way uh because i feel like if you're listening to this you're a super fan and you deserve to hear it but for the sake of not for the sake of being humble i've never publicly and no we we made a conscious effort to never be like oh we're the league that swallows other leagues because we don't want to be seen as having big heads or like being some kind of hot shots because we're not we're not making money off this it's not some giant conglomerate however one thing nobody really seemed to notice is that we swallowed a good deal of grind time after grind time closed. Um, you know, uh, Sunny Bamboo and Spy MC and Lush One all ended up booking matches and hosting for us at different times. And yeah. then what happened with bringing Breakneck in in the North Division? So the first expansion we did, which I was, which I oversaw, was the was the North Division, and that was Breakneck who was helping organize Loudmouth League. And then basically Loudmouth, we we kind of swallowed them. Um, and so the, you're kind of seeing the continuation of that trend of a league that's having troubles that's, or not, I don't know, a league where people are looking to be part of a bigger network, I'll say that. And then we kind of like make them part of what we're doing. Because from the very beginning when it came, because you know, when I started expanding No Coast, when it became more than just being in Columbia, Missouri, it was like, okay, I don't want to become Grind Time because Grind Time went down in flames. Like, it was an embarrassment for for everybody involved. That I think is what it, I mean. It was, you know, severely mismanaged, and so it was like, we don't want to be too big for our own good. So I only wanted to get people involved that we've been working with for a long time that were already proven battle organizers unlike grind time where they would just let you become one if you said you would and you had some money you know yeah and so with the eccm guys geez just because of like cat mob back in the day and everything like shit i've i've been knowing those guys as internet friends for like five years now you know and so it's like obviously we trust them they're they don't they're not outsiders they're like our buddies and they know how to host some good battles they know how to film a battle right you know they know how to make it feel like a good time and it's like relaxed and it's the same thing with king of the ronalds and i'm not saying we became king of the ronalds i'm not saying we swallowed them what i'm saying is from those guys doing that league we know that it's the same vibe and we know that they've got talent and they know how to do it right and so it's like all right you guys you're not some new heads just popping up it's like let's have you all become part of no coast now definitely i like it man and um I'm I'm gonna be sitting down with Bill Blaze on Saturday, so cool. we'll be able to discuss that further on on his part as well. I he's know good he's um, entertaining guy. Yeah, and he he's already mentioned he's got a 
a very fun story about how him, Mackenzie, Canal, Mickey, Bowski, uh, and people people like that all shared an Airbnb in oh, Minneapolis yeah. for the No that Coast was, event. So I, I was there. That 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 was a wild night. It, it was. Uh... Yeah, it was like surreal energy in the air. I remember my, 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 I kept, I kept thinking to myself, I was like, what if these guys? And I'm completely sober. Keep that in mind. I'm like thinking to myself, what if these UK guys are all faking their accents? They can't really sound like that. And I like go off to get a glass of water in the kitchen. My brother comes up to me, Mantra, and he's like, hey man, does it feel like these guys are faking their accents? And I was like, thank you. Like, I know that's a weird story, but it was just like a weird, it was just a surreal night. And yeah, sorry to get off track or I don't mean to cut into any of Bill Blaze's stories, but the thing that happened to me is, man, Canal was all, it was just, it was my first time meeting him and he was all fucked up and it just seemed like he was like threatened by me or something. And he was like, oh, you think you're, you think you're so hot, right? You know, you film the battles and he, I don't know. I can't, he was just saying just so much shit. He was just, he just kept com- coming up to me and talking shit. And I remember just being like, hey, man, I'm existentially sound. You can't shake my foundation. And he was like, what? And, and, I, was, and, I, was like, and I was like, my girlfriend's hot, man. I like my job. You can't get to me. And he was like, what? <laughs> but uh, but uh, it felt like I was like, am I going to have like, I haven't, I haven't been at that point. I, you know, I hadn't been in a fist fight in like a decade. I was like, am I gonna have to fucking fight this guy? Like, what, what's going on here? And then now, I don't know how it started, but now we're like besties. Now we like chat over Facebook, and we've done like a number of songs together. And I don't, I don't know how that transition happened, or I don't fully understand it. But that's the origin story of Canel and Cal being friends. Yeah, and I mean, with what you said about the accents you did kind of get a very broad mixture of UK accents in that room. Right. Uh, it's um, and it might Mackenzie have been thing- to Mickey yeah. is one of the biggest differences that could- you can get from the UK, I think. But Mackenzie with some drinks in him, I was like, I guess you're saying words. It's like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to have to trust that this makes sense somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, some a lot of people from the south of England struggle to understand Mackenzie most of the time. So okay, I, I can imagine it being a bit of a trip for you guys over there in that sense. Okay. And like yeah. Also Canal so Canal's from North Wales and yeah. I live in South Wales at the moment. Oh uh, and they're not particularly far apart, but the you guys don't sound alike. No, there, yeah, there's a big, a big difference in the accent in that sense. They're they're almost more Liverpudlian to an extent, so like a bit of a Liverpool okay. accent. But I understand. Yeah, it's there's it, it, definitely a, a big mixture over there at that stage. But with um, how did it come about for those guys to come over originally then? That also was – that was like breakneck basically doing that. But I, I think the simple ver- – beyond the, 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 the logistics, which I, I, I don't have any details on, I would just say that we're just huge fans of King of the Ronalds. Um, just their whole uh, – you guys would say taking the piss out of it, right? Just like not taking it seriously uh, was just really appealing to us. Just them kind of trolling and having a good time and drinking too much was like, hey, they're doing the no-coast thing. Um, and um, – so, um, yeah, I think I, I think after that, it was like, oh, we just got to make it happen. Got to hang out with you guys. Feed you acid. Fuck your heads up. Makes sense. And, and then I interviewed everybody and it was complete chaos. Everybody's like talking over each other. It was just absurd. you can watch me. And I'm just like, uh, I'm like, I don't know where to hold the mic. I'm just like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, 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 I watched that last night for the first time and then. I, I, I saw something in the comments about like what the hell like why are these guys talking about Hitler whereas to someone from the UK no, who, who's met Mickey on a couple of occasions did not surprise me whatsoever oh I'm yeah okay you, but I do have a good behind the scenes story about that is is you know in that interview Mickey is like uh 
he's like, I'm, I'm Hitler. I, I, I haven't been doing good things. I have good intentions, but I've been doing it the wrong way. And, you know, maybe Ur and I, our differences aren't that big anyway. And it's like, if he wanted to come around, I would work with him again. And it, that wouldn't be so bad because I've done some stupid things because I'm Mickey Worthless. And then he keeps talking. He goes on. And then uh, the interview was over. And uh, he, he goes back inside from the porch. And he's with the, I don't know, who, I want to say Reverse Live said it to him. But somebody was like, hey, man, do you know what you just said out there? And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, you just said you'd work with Ur on camera. And he goes, I said, what? Oh, fuck no. And he starts screaming about how much he hates Ur again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that also does not surprise me at yeah. all. I, I used to love how Mickey, Mickey basically started a league off just completely trolling Ur. Just hate, hate, hatred. Yeah. Yeah. Yet yeah, he'd still wear don't flop merch yeah. whilst hosting his <laughs> events, and it, it it's just great. I loved it. And then Amazing. I don't know if you're aware, but Mickey actually went back to don't flop. I do, like. which is it makes so little sense that it actually kind of clicks in a way. It's like well, because Ur is so. I mean, Mickey wins in that whole beef, right? Like yeah. Look where Ur is and look where Mickey is. I mean, you know, Mickey came out victorious in a weird way or came out unscathed. Everybody has just accepted that that's what he is. And so in the end, it's just two shady guys hanging out together. I mean, it's like, all right. But uh, yeah, I actually uploaded a battle that was terrible. It was on like five hours notice and it was XQZ versus Shake in Chicago, just in like Pompey's basement. And it was so bad that I took King of the Ronalds idea and I put sound effects over it and like inserted all these crazy video clips. And then I just called it a King of the Ronalds title match and uploaded okay. it as that. And I then like I, I want to say, and I might be misremembering, but I want to say that Tom at Battle Rap Resume was reviewing all of the King of the Ronalds title matches and counted it. And I've seen blogs and people be like, yeah, and then No Coast hosted one of them. And all that was was me throwing the title in just to fuck around. <laughs> That's I, brilliant. It was, I, no contact. Just I just was uploading it and I put KOTR title match. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's I think. Um, so I, I don't know how much of Battle Rap resume you've seen, but there's. Tom did a very good job at trying to to equally post about King of the Ronalds as he did with Don't Flop, which at the time I, I I respect him for that because King of the Ronalds was a difficult league to follow yeah. in the sense that it would take them sometimes over a year to release battles from an event kind of thing. And it was it, it must have been tough to have done. But yeah, Mickey... Actually, there, there's an episode with Mickey where Mickey essentially spends about an hour just shouting at Tom. Um, <laughs> basically, the, don't flop back before King of the Ronalds was a thing, quite a while before. Don't flop released this kind of extra footage series that, or like an experiment that they did, which was called uh, the In the House Tour. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw and, all that. Yeah, and I saw Tom's breakdown of it. Yes. OK, great. That was yeah. Cool. So yeah. That cuts things a bit shorter. But basically, Mickey saw that and completely lost his mind that Tom had used the footage without asking Mickey. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, th there's quite a. It's quite a funny episode that's definitely worth watching if you know Mickey in person as well, where he just goes off on a tangent about Tom being a culture vulture. And oh, no. Yeah, it's it's that's a train cool. wreck of an interview, but it's also extremely entertaining. Cool. Just because it's Mickey. But I definitely recommend that. But yeah, yeah. it's. Um, I, I, there's definitely two kinds of battle rappers and it's the controlled, you know, hip hop, you know, your dumbfoundeds and your, and your Pat stays and, you know, the source, these ultra composed, well thought of, 
you know, you got the comedy timing and the technicality. And then you just have the fucking lunatics where you're like, dude, something's you, good thing you're battling. Because what would be happening if you never found battling and got your disasters and your Mickey worthlesses? And like, I'd also throw in your, you know, like loaded lux and like dudes where it's like, you, you, there's no guessing how they're thinking. And there's yeah. something there's something about that unpredictability that is super dangerous, just as a character in battle rap. There's something about that where you're like, man, I don't know. I don't know who's showing up. I don't know what we're going to get. It keeps no, you No, definitely. Yeah. yeah it's, I've always said Mickey Worthless couldn't be. So I've always compared him to Daylight in the sense that you, yeah. they, they're absolutely not similar, yet they're so similar in many ways. Like they're both. As you said, you don't, you never know what is going to happen when they get up on the stage or yeah. it's, it, it's fantastic. I love it. And battle rap, battle rap as a whole attracts so many strange people, but it's such a niche yeah. scene that it, it makes it what it is. And I, I, I love it. Yeah. I mean, character is what it's all about. I, definitely. I used to be, I used to, try to be as funny as possible or try to be as technical as possible. And all that's just a waste of time that you, you have to find a way to take, to figure out what parts of your character people like and blow them up and exaggerate. You have to find a way to share your character with the world. That's why people are watching this. You know, there, there, there's a reason that the first wave of battlers are still way more popular than basically all the other guys that came out in the last 10 years combined. You know, it's um, that that first wave of dudes, you're not going to beat it. And it's because they're these big archetypes, you know, and then everything else. Most things have just fallen into those types, those character types that were created with that first wave of, you know, 50 guys. Sure. No, and like, um, I'm very interested in, in like kind of getting as many people on this show as possible from as many different kind of scenes as possible as well. Um, yeah. And I do have quite a few of the no coast guys booked in kind of thing now. So as Ooh. well as yourself, we're I'm going to be speaking with shake. Um, I'm going to be speaking with Roe. Um, yeah. or is it, it is Roe, isn't it? Not, it is it's, it's not R-O or, yeah. Yeah, well, he goes by Mr. Um, two, Mr. Two Letters, but yeah, you just say it Roe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, um, I've reached out to, like, Human, I would love to get Human on the show, I'm a massive fan of his. Me too, yeah, um, he's a great guy too. Yeah, I've heard, yeah, and he, he's really uh, just criminally underviewed in terms of his his battles as well like i'm a huge fan of his but is there anyone that you'd recommend to reach out to that would have some interesting stories as well yeah definitely breakneck is you know the other division head in there that um has, has like i said like me was hosting shows for you know five or ten years before all these this league stuff even started you know, so he and then being in Minneapolis, which is like that hub for hip hop, he's he's definitely got some good insight for sure. But yeah, you I mean, you 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 told me you've been reaching out to bigger names, and that's that's my advice too is just start start hitting up everybody. And I know with 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 me being some random kid from Missouri, uh, eventually convincing um, all these names to come. I mean, I I think what happened is like. We, 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 I booked like unorthodox phrases for like a hundred dollars. And I think he went back down to Florida and kind of told direct that I was cool and that we were cool. And then as soon as direct no knew, he called me. And then I think, I think he kind of spread the word. And then all of a sudden it was like the floodgates opened and like everybody from grind time was coming to us. And so I think what I'm saying is it just, it just takes that, that one person to get in you know, that's a big name. I'm not a big name, but you know, like, it, you know, like you talked about, you know, interviewing real deal or something it's, or, you know, thesaurus, like you get one of those guys that really is excited about what you do. They'll put the word out and it'll, 
it'll spread fast. You just got to keep keep building it up. Oh, of course. And for me, to be honest, I'm not I'm not aiming for for this show to get you know loads of views or anything like that. It is just yeah. it, I I enjoy doing it and I enjoy speaking to everyone. It's just there's there's just a, a a very small list of certain people that I've I've just been a fan of for a very long time that I would love to sit down with kind of thing and I've I've reached out to those guys first just to to try mm -hmm. and gauge some interest and stuff but you know it's it's more I I enjoy speaking to everybody and and anybody that's involved in the scene really you know I've had that's cool. By next week, we'll have then had people on from, I think it will then be 12 countries now. Wow. Um, so just hearing stories from all over the world, really, it's been great fun. But That's cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and so many different angles, so many different perceptions about it. Yeah. Definitely. That's yeah, wild. So it's, yeah, yeah, we'll have um, had people from so UK, Ireland, America. Um, Australia, New mm. Zealand, the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, South Africa, Botswana. There's Whoa. someone from the Bahamas is coming on. Um, yeah, there's there's all sorts, man. So it's it's wow. it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm really interested in some of those spots, like hearing what they would have to say because you know spots like Australia and. Um, uh philippines and uh another you didn't mention them but another scene i'm thinking of is like um like sweden and norway is like there were these scenes that popped up and they had really high quality battles for like two years and then they were gone yeah you know and it's like okay Definitely. so where's all your talent you know you had this world-class talent and i think that it all was just focused around two or three people that were keeping it active and had the camera you know or whatever you know, talked people into it. And uh, it's like, yeah, I, I definitely took it for granted and thought those scenes would go on forever. Um, and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I mean, the market's really saturated, so I can see why you wouldn't want to keep a league going. But yeah, that's wild. I, I was going to say, if you're asking for people to reach out to, I would definitely talk to XQZ, who was our league champ for 10 years um, out of Chicago. So... He Breakneck and XQZ are both already locked in as well, actually. Oh, damn. Yeah, yeah. so XQZ is actually on, I believe he's coming on this weekend. Um, yeah, ask him about the uh, freestyle events. He, he, I've seen XQZ win, win uh, I don't know, like close somewhere close to 10 freestyle tournaments just some half of them not filmed just in bars here in Colombia. Right. Amazing. Yeah. I'm a big fan of his as well. And, um, yeah, it was really great to see him get to battle somebody like thesaurus. Cause I, I think he's, he's often been maybe overlooked for, for the big name battles, if that makes sense. So that was really fun to see. And good to see, obviously Saurus takes every battle seriously, but yeah, good to see it you know it'd be a, a really strong battle as well and xqz is yeah. actually i think probably the only person that's like consistently battling on no coast that i've been able to say that i've seen battle in person um oh really oh because yeah you put it at a don't flop event yeah that's it yeah so um yeah, I got to see him battle Craft D, which was great, but I'd love to see him, you know, eventually get over here again. I was trying to push for him to be booked on the recent Broken Resolutions card in Ireland, but um, I think by the time I'd suggested it, they'd already filled the card, unfortunately, but mm. hopefully they, something can happen for him to come back over here again soon. And with that no coach starting here, I mean perfect opportunity i guess oh yeah definitely um you know you know um, who i would inter you know i would interview if, if i was you is uh, everybody knows okay yeah that's a good shout he um he's just had such a weird um career 
because he started doing these like freestyle tournaments in Hawaii, which yeah. beyond his existence, I would never have known was a thing. And he's got those on film and then he does scribble jam and does really good. And then it's like, yeah, when I interviewed him, it was a wild ride of a story. I felt like our interview could have gone on even longer, you know, battled disaster as a 19 year old, you know, yeah. and, and man, he, he's just an artist. He's an artist. Makes some, makes some bugged out uh, tunes. Definitely. Yeah. I've heard some of his music and it's, um, it's interesting, but uh, yeah, I'd love to speak to him, man. That's a, a good shout. I, I might try and reach out sometime soon, but it's a, a good list of people. And yeah, I, I'm looking forward to speaking to a lot more, you know, especially Breakneck XQZ and Bill Blaze, people like that. It's it's great fun. But I mean, with No Coast as a whole, then, is there any further plans to kind of expand further down the line with obviously no coast uk and uh new england starting up is there any other ideas in the pipeline well i'll tell you what when there's no events allowed legally in the world it's it's just so easy to announce that we're opening divisions so i think we should announce you know no coast china no coast japan you know no coast right just do all the announcements because nobody's gonna <laughs> know if it's real um no, but um, I one day – this is – God, I've been saying this in interviews for 11 years now, but I hope that one day we can figure out um, No Coast uh, Colorado um, because there's a lot of talent there. And, man, I'll just say it. They cannot get their shit together. It is a shit show out there. The organizers they have, um, I feel bad for the talent. And, um, right. It's a be- it's such a beautiful place. I would just honestly like to have an excuse to go, you know, visit my friends in Denver every once in a while. It's just, it's just, you know, it's beautiful. They're just a great place to visit. Nice people. Um, but um, and, and 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 there's there's some talent out there as well. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. Like I said, it has to. The, you have to you have to catch it at the right time. I think it has to be perfect. And with UK and with New England, it was perfect. You know, for all the reasons I was saying, um, expanding the right way is so much more important than just expanding because nobody really cares. We've never been the league to be like, look at us. We're taking over. No coast runs the Midwest or, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? Like we've we've never been those guys and we've always tried to just be like, all right, let's do things the right way and have fun and wait for other people to have an opinion about us, you know? So I wouldn't say expansion is a big priority. It's just when it lines up, it lines up. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to turn it away. If there's a lot of talent and, 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 and solid fucking organizers that are our friends waiting to go, it's like, let's do it. Sure. No, that but makes again, sense. All, all, all credit to breakneck and shake though, who really, you know, I basically built a model of how to do an expansion and then those guys worked out all of the logistics of actually doing it. So all credit goes to Shake. He's the one putting hours in, not not me, you know. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. And it, with the Colorado scene, I know I've not I've not really seen too many like battles that have come from the Colorado scene, if I'm honest. But I know that there's a a battle here in the UK called Most Prob. Um, yeah. He was booked to go and battle in, I want to say Denver. Um, and I don't really know the full story. I can't remember what it was, but I know that he had a horrendous experience with like not being told where his hotel was and things yeah. along those lines for, for, you know, a good 12 hours or so after he'd arrived in the city and, had a very hard time for a couple of days leading up to the event. And then I don't think the battle even ended up happening. Oh my so, God. Yeah. Can you, can you imagine? Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's not nice, but yeah, there, I think there's definitely some talent now. I know there's a couple of guys from Colorado that appeared on don't flop when they did the USA tour. So Yeah. That would uh, that'd be interesting to see. But there's 
so recently no coast put on you know a a phenomenal event with you know the lex luther versus row battle and the so that was one of the valentine's day massacre events or is that that's right correct? yeah in chicago yeah and I saw the A Ward versus Ultimate Beast Primus battle that dropped the other day. Um, yeah, that is incredible stuff. How did that come about? Well, Primus is one of our organizers. Right. Okay. And um, is you know he um, he he just kind of came out the gate. I I, I want to say he hadn't even like heard of battle rap like four years ago or so, something something crazy like that. And just kind of became obsessed. And uh, he kind of came out the gate swinging um, with his own style really developed. And he's just been on an upward trajectory where I think each one of his showings has been better. And so it's I think it's exciting to give a guy a big shot like that that's already getting, you know, better and better, um, you know, and um, as opposed to just giving XQZ like every big name or whatever. Um, but um What's crazy is I haven't even actually watched that battle yet because I only got there on the second day because okay. with my job, I have a group. I have outpatient group with my teens until 9 p.m. on Fridays. And so I uh, I want to say I – no, I think I slept in Columbia and woke up and hopped on a train. Oh, yeah, and then I went straight to the event once I got there. So that was a crazy day for me. And then so I literally like woke up, traveled got to the venue and was hosting for day two. So I saw a Roe versus Lex Luthor and all that, all that other stuff, but I missed the first day, which is too bad, but. Okay. Yeah. No, they, it's yeah. Incredible battle. And uh, Lex Luthor versus Roe is, is absolutely incredible too, but. That was, that was nuts. Yeah. It's so cool to have a, a niche battle like that. It's yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was a huge fan of that battle. They're the, the only two to have dropped from the event as a whole so far. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Is there any other battles to look out for when they do drop? Oh, yeah. That whole second night was crazy here. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. So I'm going to like sign into the YouTube so I can tell you the right thing. My memory is so shot, man. So much. I had too much fun when I was younger. Now I, can... <laughs> I mean, it was. I know um, Human and Mr. Biscuit battled right oh yeah and i was the judge for that um i was the judge for that it was our, our title match because after after 10 years xqz um stepped out of the position he was tired of beating people i guess and um so yeah he did that title match and i honestly hate judging if somebody if somebody has judged battles and they don't tell you that they hate doing it something is wrong with them they're yeah. like a assist or something because it, it, it is nerve wracking. And I'm so happy that um, basically when, it, when you know, when everybody individually told Sheikh who we thought won that battle. And then afterwards, I went to the judges and said, you know, um, hey, I had it this way. I had it two one with this round being that. And all the judges agreed with me. And I was like, thank God, you know, because yeah. you never you never want to be the only guy that you know whatever you don't want to be the outlier but yeah i was like okay we all saw it the same way nice and chef trez was on the card as well right he was but i think he was day one or he i, I missed that battle too either i was outside or it was day one i can't remember right okay um no, that... but, but yeah the the human versus mr biscuit is uh that's like the future of battle rap like those guys are just both doing I don't know. It sounds corny to say it out loud, but crazy to relevant multis. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I do completely agree. I'm a, a huge fan of both of those guys. So it'll be good to it'll be good to watch that. Definitely. But is there so obviously you guys have the tournament going on at the moment where you're now up against UK favorite Balski. Um, yeah. Mackenzie versus Carter Deems, which is the battle that I never knew I wanted to see until that was announced. That's amazing. But yeah, right. Is there, I, I, I know it's, it's hard to say cause the, everything's a bit up in the air right now, but is there any other plans for events on the pipeline anytime soon or. 
was everything just a bit kind of on hold for now? Yeah, I'm going to have to say that everything's on hold, basically. I think that as many of the same matches as we can get to happen that we had planned in the first place is what we're going to try for. But it's like, what do you do, you know? And it's like, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I think when we come back, it's going to be with a vengeance. Um, because there's going to be, because people are still talking. It's not like the scene stopped, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. But I, I'm just so happy that we're able to do these online video tournaments, like keep entertainment coming out and keep people engaged and not forget about, you know, that this stuff is out here. So, and I know it's been great for me just to keep my pen going. I wouldn't have written any rap music if it wasn't f- for being in this tournament. So. Definitely. No, man. And it's, uh, I'm very excited for these battles to start dropping as well. It's it's great to see so many leagues still able to provide content even yeah. during these strange times. So they're on the pa- they're on watch. Patreon now. No Coast Patreon just for five dollars. You can see them all. See the first round now. I would be it would be wrong of me if I didn't say that. But uh, I, I'm going to tell you, we talked right after I recorded my round for Bowski. And I was in the bathroom of the practice space of PDM, of that punk venue, because it's got all this cool graffiti and like it just sounded good. And I was in there and I do my two minute round and my last line, this is the first time I've gotten through the round. I wrap it all from memory and my last line is about slapping him and I slap my own hand and then it, it, it knocked the light switch and there was no case in the light switch and it blew the fuse and sparks flew and blew the light switch out on me. And so I'm like, well, I guess it's that take. And if, <laughs> if you watch the video in slow motion, you can see the electric stream going to my hand. But I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it or anything. I was just like, oh, that was fucking awesome. I was like, all right, that's a sign. We're done. So, and it's, it's going to look great on the video, right? Yeah, I'm pretty stoked. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked. I do my whole round. I smack a light switch. I basically get almost electrocuted and then i laugh like a maniac and it's over so that's amazing yeah no, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that man that's gonna be really cool but and um, yeah i mean I've i'm just kind of, um, sorry cool oh i was just gonna say um you know the the, the winner of uh, mckenzie versus carter deems is is who i'll be up against and so i'm, I'm i put a lot of effort into my riding against bowski because he's very good, and I would very much like to battle either McKenzie or Carter Deems. And to be completely honest with you, I, if I could battle Carter, that that would be um, that would be ideal. It's probably my only chance to battle him because um, he's a pretty big name. Um, so uh, man, I, I I really hope I I really hope that Bowski doesn't have any magic tricks up his sleeve like I did, and that uh, yeah, and that I get to battle Carter. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be great to see. And Carter is. I, in my opinion, probably the most unique figure in battle rap, and yeah, he's he's incredible. Like it, his writing is phenomenal, and I'm oh yeah, a huge fan, huge huge fan. So the, any uh, content we get to see with Carter is is always good fun. Oh yeah, it's it's funny because Carter always I I always love to give No Coast credit the environment of no coast credit for creating Carter as we know him because he battled for like a year in grind time, but he would like use gun bars, just gun bars and do like name flips. And, um, he, he never talked about cats or microwaves or he, he was basically just a battler and he would cuss. And, um, there wasn't very much of the self degradation And then he came here and I think he was like, well, now I'm in no coast. So it's time to experiment or whatever. I don't know. I've never discussed it with him, but he came to no coast. And the first time he came to no coast, he was like talking about uh, drinking milk, even though he's lactose intolerant and shitting his pants. But he's like, but how can I not milk's the only thing that relaxes me, you know? And like people lost it. And we, that our crowd loved what he was doing in everything he said was just about himself. And ever since then, that's been Carter is him doing what he does. So, um, yeah, I can't take credit for anything personally, but I can say that I think that it's the kind of environment that helped create that unique 
take and helped him go so far with it. I think that actually had a lot to do with the, with us. So that's great, man. And yeah, you know, he's, he's fantastic. He's so entertaining to watch and oh yeah, I'm a big fan. And something that you know, you may be aware of this guy. I'm not sure how, how much of the UK scene you, you've seen through the years, but we have a, a battler over here called the calcium kid. Yeah, I want to say I've seen him back in the day at least. Yeah, he's not battled now for probably about four or five years or so, but mm-hmm. he's he's a big fan favorite in the UK, and he's he's kind of Carter esque. Um, mm. So if you get the chance, it's definitely worth watching a bit of uh, the Calcium Kid as well. He's he's great fun to watch, but I mean. With the the show, I've been I've been ending on some random questions that are kind of related to music, and then just some completely random questions at the end. But in okay. terms of live performances that you've seen, who would you say are the best musicians that you've ever seen live, like gig wise? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot because I, I worked venues for five years. I worked roadhouses. Um, so I've seen, I've seen, I've, yeah, I've seen some concerts. Um, I'm going to have to say like Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton and the P-Funk. Um, I've seen them a few times and they're, it's like, what the fuck is happening? Like, you don't even understand it. It's so organic and, 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 uh, it just feels like friends jamming, but it's also really catchy. Definitely them. And I don't know, when I saw him, like, their bassist was wearing a diaper and a bunch of weird visual shit was going on. One of these girls had roller skates on and, like, a skin-tight gold jumpsuit. So I was like, all right, all right, something to look at here. Okay. Big, nice. big, big, big raging debate as to whether the bassist was wearing that because he had to be on stage the whole time as a bassist and if he was actually, you know, going to use the diaper. Big debate still going on. Um, and then I'm going to say the Violent Femmes were probably my favorite live band I saw it was just so fucking weird because they had the drummer who only uses a snare drum in one cymbal they had him up front in the spotlight with this like flamboyant Hawaiian shirt on and he's just going nuts and then behind him in like just a regular dress shirt towards the back was the bass player and then in the very back along with the line musicians and all black as if he's a roadie is the singer guitarist and I just couldn't get over that but um both of those influenced by, you know, hallucinogens. So I might be a little biased, but I call it how I see it. Even if I don't encourage drug use anymore. Gosh damn it. If it didn't make me feel like, you know, my wedding night at those two shows. So, yeah. That's fair enough, man. No, and I'm aware of the violent films. Obviously they're, they're a pretty big band too. So it's yeah. cool that you got to see them, but um, unlike, is there any lesser known musicians or artists that you're a big fan of at the moment that maybe myself or the UK listeners aren't aware of? Yeah, God, a ton. I, I'm pretty obsessed with um, Lacutus, who was on Greedhead, which was Das Racist or Das Racist record label. Okay. Yeah. They were, they were a record label of all first generation uh, children of immigrants which I think is just interesting in the first place. And uh, Locutus is loosely affiliated with EO Dub, End of the Week, where Iron Solomon comes out of. Like, So it's like he is this real gutter punk kid uh, doing rap kind of as a joke in a traditionalist hip-hop way. And so it's just this weird blend of tongue-in-cheek lyricism with him saying stuff like i'm a death shark i'm a blood eagle i'm a death shark i'm a blood eagle and it's like what does it mean i don't care i don't care what it means you know i was always a big fan of Ghostface. you know it's like it is, Ghostface isn't saying anything you know but it, <laughs> yeah if, if it speaks to your heart if it sounds real you know then it is i love so anyway lacutus is one of my favorite artists i know i mentioned it earlier but everybody knows who goes by ig kwan when he makes music um E-I-J-I-K-W-A-N, I.G. Kwan, is like my favorite musician right now. Like I rank him with anybody. I play that shit more than other rappers. He's just doing this vibed out, doped up, 
incomprehensible, heartfelt thing. It's, it's wild. He's like, he, he's the epitome of, I, I think rap for a long time was like, I can hustle and I'm angry. I can hustle and I'm angry. And they kind of branched off in a few different ways. And, and IG Kwan is doing like, I'm a hustler and I'm sad. I'm a hustler and I'm existentially unsound. And like, I think that that is, for me, infinitely interesting and relatable. No, I like it, man. And yeah, I've heard some of his music and I am a, I am a fan. So I definitely see where you're coming from. And yeah, he's... He's done some stuff on the Ruin Your Day tapes recently as well. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I have a, I have a two-part best of his music on my YouTube channel as well. If you, because he's also, uh, like me, a kind of inaccessible artist in that he kind of has too much material and it's all different types of genres. But if you wanted, a, if you wanted just a good solid hour of uh, listenable stuff, then uh, yeah, best of IG Kwan, best of everybody knows on my YouTube is a great place to start. Nice, I'll check that out, man. But um, apart from that, in terms of the the very random questions, so do you have a favorite sports team? Are you a, a sports fan at all? No, not not at all, honestly. No. Um, no. Yeah, I was always the artsy kid, you know, like. Yeah, always the rebel. Which you know, sports are so popular over here. It's uh, it's definitely alienated me, you know, from a from from a, from a male friendship or two. But uh, no, I always just kind of I think battling was my sport for a long time there, you know. Um, but no, I never followed sports at all. I tried to go to a football game once and I got too drunk at tailgating and ended up like half passed out playing with somebody's baby going through the baby's mom's purse with the baby and then missed the game. When I came to from the baby interaction, I realized that I'd missed the game. So, um, (laughs) I I feel like if I had like a pack of dudes that could tell me about it, I could tolerate MMA. And if I had to pick a team sport, I once saw half of a basketball game that my grandpa was watching and I was pretty engaged. I didn't know who to root for, but man, that was impressive what they were doing. <laughs> nice one. I, like I don't know. It, my, right? my, my girlfriend's a, a trainer. My girlfriend's a um, a, a a CrossFit trainer. Okay. And um, so she, it's funny because she takes athleticism very seriously. And some of her friends are like some of the best CrossFit. Um, uh, women in, in the, in the country, but, uh, she's not competitive. So she just, she'll just, she'll just go to competitions when, when somebody needs like a, a tag team partner or something, but she's buff as hell. So it's funny. Cause she'll like go down to the basement to throw weights around. And I'm like, what's, what's song uh, about my fear of death sound like? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you have to be incredibly fit to do crossfit right that's probably one of the most intense forms of exercise so yeah well it's hilarious because she's she works on her body hours every day she studies how to do it the best she teaches other people her her guns are massive she's just so much muscle i remember her once telling me that her her uh, muscle to fat ratio was like as high as organically possible without using steroids and still, if we fight, I can just hold her at arm's length because I've got a good foot and 100 pounds on her. So it's just that simple. I just hold my hand on her head and she'll swing at me and she still can't get me. So <laughs> all that work for what? You know, I'm still just a bigger dude. Go you, man. But... Yeah, I know. I know. I'm not complaining. No, but, no I don't, I've, I've very recently got quite into – nfl so really it's again never been accessible in the uk until very wow. recently um and i've suddenly got really into it but it's uh i can understand you not being a fan you know I, i'm not i'm not super i can't stand baseball i know that's yeah. big in, in the states it bores me but oh yeah it's that's awful those people are yeah. drinking too much too much beer i um yeah, I don't get it either. 
I don't no. want to claim. I'm not claiming it. No. no, no, it's a strange thing to sit and watch for me. It's very eventless, but I was, um, I was I was very serious about drumline. It's not a sport, but it's the closest I ever got. I helped start drumline club when I was in high school. It was pretty serious stuff. I uh, what's that? Drumline. Um, it's like we like marching band. Um, just the snare drums, bass, uh, quads, um, and stuff. And it's like you you march in different formations and um, play really intentionally difficult, you know, drills. Um, but uh, yeah, so I when I was like 16, 17, I was like doing arrangements for uh, drumline and um, helping choreograph uh, choreograph uh, marches. So. It was, it, not something that every 16-year-old does, so I'll throw it in now that I have a chance. No, oh, cool. And would you, would you guys, like, perform at, like, say, sports games and stuff then? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, you do, like, right. the half-time, halftime show, and if there was, like, a pep rally for, for basketball, we'd, like, go in the middle of the gymnasium and, and do our show to, like, open up and do halftime and stuff, so... Yeah, I was right. pretty cool. I was pretty serious about that. I mean, I'm shit. I, I was a shithead. I was like a, a you know, I, I was a messed up shithead pretty early on. And then it was like I was like, you know, switch modes and be like, oh, march in a line. You know, like it was like this perfect uh, bit of structure in another world, otherwise chaotic world. So I really fell in love with it. So, yeah, it meant a lot to me and uh, still play the drum kit. So got something out of it in the long run. Nice. Nice, yeah. man. And then if you – so I'm guessing this will be quite an easy question considering you're, you're yet to, to come out of the States and you're, you're planning to very soon. But if you could pick one destination in the world for your next holiday, where's kind of top of your list of places you'd like to go? Yeah, that, that's hard because I, I don't know anything about it really, you know. But I definitely just want to get bugged out. Like I know my my girlfriend's last travels were in just the like the the hills of Vietnam, and like she just went way off of where tourists usually go and had like a tour guide um like uh rent rent a van and it was like her and the van driver and a tour guide and her friend and like you know just visiting these tiny villages like that sounds really cool to me like truly seeing how other cultures work. But then I think on the other side of that, I'm always asking her to bring me back like mixtapes and like I want her to find me rappers and like these weird um, removed parts of the world. And she always she, she never can find those things. Um, so if there's some kind of hidden pocket of hip hop or punk rock, like I'd, I'd love to find that, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, man. That's cool. That's a good answer. And. Um, the, the final one, which has brought up okay. some divided opinions. Okay. But uh, in your opinion, what is the go-to snack? Go-to snack, Doritos. Doritos and Mountain Dew. You know, I'm a I'm a '90s kid. Doritos and Mountain Dew. This just what flavor though? Endless. I'm gonna say Cool Ranch, and I still eat all sorts of junk food and fast food, but I do sugar-free. So like. Diet Mountain Dew and Cool Ranch Doritos I have on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, I like it. I don't know if I don't know if you know this, but it's um okay. I'm gonna I, this is gonna sound like it's coming out of left field. I'm gonna keep it brief. Punk the term started from a magazine called Punk Magazine where kids pretended to be journalists so they could get into shows for free, and then they had to write this magazine because they'd gotten into the show, and so they wrote about their love for cheeseburgers. And so part of the origin of American punk is the love for cheeseburgers. And now in the underground, like crust punk communities still raging, you have to identify as a pizza punk or a burger punk or the ever popular now taco punk. And I was always a pizza punk. And so many friends of mine have pizza tattoos and have a hardcore dedication to it. And I used to sleep on the porch of this uh, punk spot called Sick Porch, and they had a big sign up that said "Pizza Punks Kill Cops." Okay, interesting. Yeah. So anti-police, pro burgers, tacos, or pizza is a identifier of like your crew in the world of underground 
American punk rock. Right, I and see. And I am a pizza punk. Let it be known. I like it. I like yeah. it a lot, man. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, cool. But yeah, I mean, Kelly, it's it's been amazing to chat to you, man. We've uh, we've gone for just under two and a half hours now as well. I've, so it's I've crushed two sugar-free purple monster energy drinks and i've never had i haven't had to pee this bad in seven eight years okay it i haven't had to pee this bad since i drove to minneapolis alone um in a subaru in my 20s and it was worth it it was worth it i hope this was worth it too i'm not however i uh expressing dedication (laughs) absolutely and i uh I don't want to be responsible for that going wrong, man. But um, it has been amazing to get you on the show, mate. And anything that you'd like put in the description to the video link-wise, please do let me know. The the video will be up on YouTube within a couple of days. But um, anything I can ever help with in the future in terms of promotion for No Coast or any music, please do hit me up, man, and I'm happy to help. I think you're. I think you're already helping just with the UK division, just getting the word out there and it coming interest, public interest coming from you. It couldn't be more real, and it, it, your enthusiasm, I'm sure, will be contagious. So I just, yeah, I just appreciate it so much. So it's super cool. It's uh, it's it's surreal. Um, just uh, having you be interested to hear what I have to say. So I really appreciate it. No, not at all, man. And it's uh, it's it's been. As I said, it's been really fun speaking to you, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come on. But uh, yeah, I you know I hope you stay safe in the these strange times that we're in at the moment, and uh, hopefully we'll get it get to chop it up again in the future. Yeah, give it a year or two. I might come. I might be over there. We might end up at the same event. Definitely, that'd be great, man. Hell yeah! All Four right, I'm lo- looking forward to hearing our voices back. I'll reliving this whole thing again in a few days. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. Yeah. And it'll be good. It should be up within, I'd say, three days or so. But yeah, we'll get it done, man. Sick. Cool. But yeah, thank you again, mate, and take care. Thanks. Take it easy. Take care of yourself. You too, man. Bye bye. All right. Bye.